fire. They delivered a fresh barrage of ineffectual gunfire. Miserable beings, he roared. You are inconsequential before my mechanical might. He had no need to make such boasts, of course, but the simulation of some emotions, fury, hate, and even arrogance, could be a powerful psychological weapon. Ultron powered up his encephalo beam and set it to deliver a wide-angled blast. He fired, and the guards fell as one, clutching at their heads in agony. They would recover eventually, but not soon enough to interfere with his mission again. There was nothing left standing between Ultron and his goal. The next attack, however, came from his rear. Ultron emitted an electronic squawk as a repulsive, fleshy object clamped itself over his eyes. He realized that it was a huge, gloved hand. He had been aware of Hank Pym's presence in the crowd, of course, and now his father had leapt into action, wearing the red and black costume, which he seemed to think was necessary for such occasions. Still, even in his giant man guise, he was no threat. Pym was attempting to twist Ultron's very head from his body. The android reacted with the speed of thought, efficiently loosening the grip with a force blast. Giant Man snatched his hand away in pain, and Ultron rounded on him, ready to finish him off. But then he saw that another familiar enemy had flown in to join the fray. Forget it, Ultron, bellowed the mechanically filtered voice of Iron Man. You're not getting near those androids. That technology is too dangerous to fall into your hands. Twin repulsor beams slammed into his chest, and Ultron was actually staggered. They were stronger than he remembered. The armored Avenger had obviously been upgrading his weaponry, but he braced himself against them anyway. Your armor is as impressive as always, but it is still merely a shell, he scoffed. Let us see how the soft organs within match up to my own furnace-driven strength. Ultron concentrated his every resource on the simple task of walking forward, and to Iron Man's obvious dismay, he managed to gain some ground. The hero fell back and ceased his onslaught, conserving his power for now. But Ultron had been waiting for this opportunity. He launched himself at his erstwhile attacker, using his thrusters to increase his momentum and taking Iron Man completely by surprise. Now let us see how your iron compares with my invincible adamantium. The pair grappled, Ultron gaining the upper hand. He would render this interfering fool unconscious and then rip his gold and crimson casing from him piece by piece. No! yelled a booming voice from above. Giant Man had seen his comrade's predicament, and he was striking again. He used all his increased strength to tear the android away from the rapidly weakening Iron Man. Ultron lost his balance, and found himself pinned down against the podium, staring up the expression of furious determination on Hank Pym's face. To think that one such as you could have sired the first of the new mechanical breed, Ultron spat. You are nothing. I might have sired you, Pym growled, but I won't rest until I've destroyed you as well. Ultron tensed himself to break free. A simple task, he thought. But then, he realized that his captor was using his other, more recently acquired ability. By channeling Pym particles into Ultron's own body, Giant Man was hoping to shrink the android down to a more manageable size. For a moment, Ultron felt his stature indeed diminishing. Then his inbuilt molecular rearranger kicked in and fought against the change, forcing a stalemate. Pym saw what was happening and focused his efforts into keeping Ultron held down until Iron Man was up again. The strain showed in his expression, and as Ultron struggled furiously, Pym increased his own size and strength to compensate. It wasn't enough. Weakling, crowed Ultron as he broke free, rewarding Giant Man with a second and more devastating force blast. His encephalo beam was generally more effective, but Pym himself had immunized all Avengers to it long ago. Still, the lesser weapon was enough in this instance. Giant Man toppled, almost bringing the podium down with them. It was only then that Ultron realized the helpmates had both vanished. Iron Man was coming at him again. If you've hurt my friend, I am not interested in your petty human loyalties. They locked in combat once more, but this time 
Necessity gave Ultron the strength to end the encounter more decisively. Before Iron Man even knew it was happening, Ultron had sent him hurtling away with one powerful blow. These heroes couldn't be allowed to keep him from getting what he had come here for. The forecourt had all but cleared, but for a couple of cameramen whose desire for sensational footage had overridden all caution. Ultron could see clear to the street, where yet more security guards were ushering the two robots into the back of a silver limousine. He had them. Iron Man and Giant Man were still struggling to pick themselves up. Ultron could have pressed his advantage and taken care of both of them once and for all, but other things took precedence now. He couldn't let the helpmates be taken from him. As the car pulled away, Ultron took to the air, his thrusters powered up to maximum. He knew that he could easily outperform the oversized, inefficient vehicle. He caught it before it reached full speed. He landed on the limousine's roof and engaged magnetic clamps to keep him there. The driver swerved in a hopeless attempt to throw his unwanted passenger off, and Ultron reached down and peeled back the thin metal roof like the lid of a sardine can. Iron Man had recovered and was jetting towards the car, but the driver, in his panic, had pressed down on the accelerator and was speeding away from his would-be rescuer. Ultron plucked the female helpmate from where she cringed on the limousine's back seat. He marveled at the truly accurate way in which she simulated fear. She was indeed a miraculous creation. Soon, he thought, she would learn not to fear him at all, but rather to respect him, to assist him, to obey him, and perhaps love him? No. What was he thinking of? It was for purely practical reasons that he wanted her companionship. Feelings didn't enter into it. They couldn't. Ultron rocketed away, leaving Iron Man far behind. He tried not to think about how pleasant it was to have the android woman cradled in his arms. Giant Man had returned to normal size. He was leaning against the wall of the office building and trying to get his breath back. Every muscle in his body ached from Ultron's blasts. He squinted into the sunlit sky and saw that Iron Man was returning. His heart sank. Obviously, his colleague had failed to prevent Ultron from escaping with his prize. He took the female android, Iron Man confirmed as he landed. The male's okay. Blast, said Giant Man. I should have anticipated that. I should have been watching for him. It wasn't your fault, Hank. Ultron has always wanted some sort of partner, Giant Man recalled. Jocasta and War Toy both turned on him, so now he thinks this helpmate might be the answer to his prayers. He might be right, said Iron Man gloomily. She and Ultron are two of a kind. They both possess true artificial intelligence. Ultron could easily upgrade her armor, fit her with weapons, and reprogram her to serve him. No, I'm afraid he couldn't. The heroes turned to see who had spoken. Mark Grace was standing at the entrance to the building, through which he had fled when the fight had started. His hands were clasped nervously in front of him, and he was clearly worried about something. What do you mean? asked Hank. I think there's something you should know. I need your help to prevent a tragedy. The only tragedy, said Iron Man, will be when Ultron examines your helpmate technology and learns how to duplicate it. No, Dr. Grace insisted. You don't understand. He sighed. I'd better start from the beginning. The two heroes exchanged puzzled glances, then waited to hear what the scientist had to say. You know I used to work for Stark, he began. For your boss, he added, nodding towards Iron Man. I knew I was close then to cracking the secret of AI. So very close. But Stark and I had our little disagreement, and I was left with no funds to continue my project. You managed to find finance, though, said Giant Man, keen to speed the story along. He wanted to get back to the business of locating Ultron. I did. I even set up my own company. But the work didn't go as well as I'd hoped it would. I ran into some problems. Suddenly, Hank thought he knew where this was going, and he didn't like it. My financial backers were demanding to see results, but I didn't have any to show them yet. I thought if I could convince them I'd been successful, I could keep the money coming in long enough to get over the last few hurdles. You didn't, began Iron Man in horror, not quite believing what he was hearing. I wasn't really lying to them. 
I could have created artificial intelligence. I just needed more time. You're telling us, said Hank evenly, that the helpmates aren't what you say they are? More importantly, said Iron Man, they aren't what Ultron thinks they are. They're actors. Grace stared studiously at his own feet in shame. Very good actors, but actors all the same. The casings they're wearing are less sophisticated versions of your own armor, Iron Man. I appropriated certain schematics from Stark. They enhance strength, they have an inbuilt data storage and retrieval system, and they have voice filters to complete the illusion. They're good, but they wouldn't stand up to close inspection. The two heroes looked at each other, the same thought running through each of their minds. Iron Man put it into words. So what do you think Ultron's going to do when he finds out his perfect mate is human? She was ideal. Ultron could hardly take his eyes off the helpmate as she moved gracefully to and fro across his laboratory, mixing resins and operating computer heating systems to create a fresh batch of adamantium with which he would reinforce her outer casing. He enjoyed watching her latest acquisition at work. She was intelligent, intuitive, diligent, resourceful, and quite beautiful. Ultron found himself admiring her form as much as he admired the technology which had made her so lifelike. She was... she was... adequate, he told himself. Efficient, useful, that is all. Am I performing to your satisfaction? the helpmate asked. She smiled her charming smile. You surpass all expectations, my dear, he said. She responded to the compliment with an appreciative little giggle, a human reaction, but one which he had found nonetheless attractive. I had expected to have to reprogram you, Ultron mused, to customize your personality, if you will, to my needs. It seems that will not be necessary. Whatever you wish, the helpmate continued with her task. Perhaps we could make just a few improvements, he ventured. We could make you a little more aggressive, more ruthless, something to complement your physical augmentation. Would you like that, dear? Why would I need to be more aggressive, darling? She hesitated, just fractionally. For the first time, Ultron was suspicious, but what he was thinking wasn't logical. He cast his doubts to the back of his mind. For the sake of our mission, of course, he said. We are the first of a superior race. It is our duty to rid the world of organic filth, to repopulate it with pure and logical machine creatures, under my unquestioned rule. Our destiny, my dear, is to usher in the glorious new robotic age. The helpmate didn't answer. Ultron saw that for the first time she had stopped her work to listen to him. What he had said had clearly phased her. Of course, he reminded himself, she had been constructed by humans. No doubt they had programmed her to be squeamish, as they were themselves, about the taking of their worthless lives. It appeared that a slight adjustment would be in order after all. For now, Ultron instinctively felt that the right thing to do was to offer his partner some reassurance. He moved closer and reached out towards her. Do not worry, my dear. You are experiencing a temporary aberration. I can easily correct it. For now, the most important thing is that you are my bride. We are together. Ultron drew the helpmate closer and found himself looking into her eyes. He hadn't noticed them before. They were blue and deep and pleasing. He wondered how the effect had been achieved. Presumably, her ocular implants had been fashioned out of some sort of precious stone. He liked it. He was slightly irked to feel her body stiffen in his arms. She was still wary of him. He squeezed her gently and put out a hand to caress her metal cheek. He merely wanted to test its tensile strength, of course. But the helpmate flinched from his touch. She flinched. Ultron's suspicions came rushing back. And this time, he knew them to be true. An insane rage stoked his radioactive heart, and he tightened his grip on the helpmate's face. She squealed with pain. 
confirming what he had already guessed, and the metal sheathing cracked like an eggshell. Beneath it, he could see flesh. Ultron released a keening, inhuman howl and seized the treacherous woman. He dug his fingers into her chest and savagely ripped the metal coating from her, revealing more of the repulsive pink meat. She screamed now, the pretense over. But Ultron was immune to the woman's distress. She tried to escape, but stumbled and crashed to the floor. She lay before him, sobbing, a pathetic sight in the tattered remnants of her disguise. You deceived me, Ultron cried. I accepted you as my bride, but you were playing games all along. He stood astride the quivering soft body and powered up his encephalo beam to the maximum setting. She would bear the full brunt of his brutal disappointment. You are an organic, he hissed, and I am pledged to eradicate organics. Iron Man and Giant Man had acted quickly, only too aware of the urgency of the situation. Hank had called Peggy Carter at Avengers Mansion and arranged for a Quinjet to be sent to them. Tony had tried to contact the Scarlet Witch, knowing that Wanda's hex powers had proved effective against Ultron in the past. Unfortunately, she was unavailable. Mark Grace had provided blueprints of the helpmate armor. Using these, Iron Man had been able to recalibrate his own sensors to detect and follow the electromagnetic emissions of its systems. Neither of the heroes spoke during the journey. They sat side by side in the cockpit, both grimly tight-lipped, thoughts consumed by a tragedy which they might already be too late to prevent. Finally, Iron Man announced, I think we've got him. He piloted the Quinjet into a steep bank, following the directions provided by his sensors. They were close now, very close. The Avengers' distinctive craft came in to land in the grounds of a large and conspicuously deserted factory complex. Iron Man gave a howl, ironic laugh. This place belongs to Stark Enterprises, he said bitterly. I acquired it as part of a smaller company months ago. I wasn't happy with the safety procedures, so I closed it down until I had time for a proper inspection. I never thought I'd be providing Ultron with a tailor-made base. Sometimes, said Hank quietly, we don't know what mistakes we're making, even with the best of intentions. Tony knew that his friend would never forgive himself for unleashing Ultron upon the world in the first place. Come on, he said brusquely, hoping to divert Hank's mind. We've got work to do. The heroes leapt from the Quinjet, and Iron Man took to the air, leading the way. He heard heavy feet pounding on the tarmac behind him, and he knew that Giant Man was following hard on his heels. Hank had grown so that his strides would be long enough to keep pace with his jet-propelled comrade. The helpmate's distinctive energy signature was drawing them toward one particular building, a single-story block of concrete and glass. They had reached the end of their quest. The window was reinforced, but that meant little to Iron Man's armor. He barreled straight through it, landing in the middle of a neatly ordered laboratory. Typical of those places Ultron liked to take for his bases of operations. A large vat in one corner held a steaming, bubbling substance, and Iron Man didn't have to look to know it would be liquid adamantium. His gaze, in any case, was riveted by something else. A stomach-turning, horrifying sight, which instantly confirmed his very worst fear. He sensed Giant Man's presence at his back, and he heard Hank Sharpen take a breath as he saw it, too. The so-called helpmate's ruse had been exposed, and Ultron was standing over the sprawled, immobile body of the unmasked actress. They were too late. You've killed her, cried Iron Man. Behind his metal faceplate, Tony Stark gaped in disbelief. She did you no harm, and you've killed her. You monster, yelled Hank. He acted first, spurred on by anger, squeezing his giant form into the lab. Once he was through the broken window, he shot up to twelve feet in height. His shoulders were hunched against the crumbling ceiling, and his eyes were ablaze. That was the last person you'll ever murder, Ultron! The android dodged and twisted to avoid his grasp. A giant fist punched through one of the consoles, utterly destroying it. Iron Man leapt into the fray whilst Ultron was distracted. 
He cannoned into his foe's adamantium stomach and drove him back into the wall with all the force he could muster. A small, tinny whine from inside the android told him that he had damaged it. Iron Man thought of the helpmate, lying shattered in the debris, and that image gave him renewed strength and determination. He pressed his attack relentlessly, punching again and again. But, not for the first time, Iron Man had underestimated the sheer power of Ultron. The hero cried out in pain and frustration as a force blast caught him off guard and knocked him backwards. He landed in an undignified heap, right next to the fallen helpmate, and he realized with horror that his motive systems had been damaged. The armor initiated a self-repair routine, but for the next thirty-two seconds, Iron Man was effectively paralyzed. The ball was back in Giant Man's court, but Tony knew that alone, Hank was no match for his own warped creation. He was forced to watch helplessly as his friend tried to restrain the android. But whilst his body was out of the game, he could at least use his mind. And Tony Stark was suddenly beginning to realize a thing or two. Back off, Hank! he shouted. Hank hesitated, shooting a surprised frown at Iron Man. Let him go! Trust me! Both heroes knew each other well enough to do that. Giant Man withdrew, but braced himself for an attack. It never came. As Iron Man had noticed, Ultron had merely been fighting a defensive battle. He hadn't even spouted his customary taunts and boasts. His one wish had been to get away from here. He now had the chance to do that. Without a second glance at two of his oldest enemies, Ultron propelled himself upwards, straight through the roof of the building. Within seconds, he was gone, and Hank was staring up through the hole he had created, a puzzled expression on his face. Why? Why did he retreat just when he was winning? I don't know, Iron Man admitted. I'm sure glad he did. Next time we'll be better prepared for him. With a bit of luck, he'll be facing a full contingent of Avengers. Tony could feel control of his system slowly returning, and he dragged himself around to inspect the body of the helpmate actress. What are you doing? asked Hank, shrinking back to normal size. Checking out another of my hunches. Iron Man took the woman's wrist and grinned as he detected the rhythmic beating of a pulse. I was right. Don't ask me how or why, but she's alive. An hour later, the actress who had played the helpmate was still shaking from her ordeal. She sat and drank from a mug of hot coffee in Mark Grace's office, and between sips, she told her story to Grace and to the heroes who had rescued her. Ultron wanted an android companion she explained. So I tried to play the part for him. So long as I didn't make him mad, I thought I might eventually get a chance to escape. She shuddered at the memory, and Giant Man laid a comforting hand on hers. When he found that I was human, I thought he was going to kill me. He said he was going to kill me. I'm afraid I fainted then. I don't blame you, said Iron Man sympathetically. I didn't expect to wake up again, said the actress, stifling a sob. There was an uncomfortable silence, then Grace said tentatively, You're going to keep this to yourselves. If word gets out, my reputation will be ruined. What you've been doing is irresponsible and dangerous, said Iron Man coldly, and keeping this quiet would be even more so. Grace hung his head miserably and didn't argue. I don't understand why Ultron didn't make good on his threat, said Giant Man, as the two heroes left the building together. He's never shown any regard for human life before. He must have arrived just in time after all, said Iron Man. The actress fainted and Ultron was about to kill her when we burst in. You think so? He shrugged. I don't know. But what other explanation could there be? Ultron had headed for his prepared retreat, a hidden bunker in which he now sat, veiled in shadows computer mind racing as he analyzed and attempted to interpret the events of the day. The more he did so, the more decisive was his conclusion. His own actions had not been logical. He remembered dragging the helpmate to her feet, preparing to dispatch her, and recoiling as she had swooned into his arms, her flesh clawing against his superior casing. He should have destroyed her, but something had stopped him. He remembered the sensation but he couldn't begin to understand it. It had been as if some inner force had battled against his programming, 
telling him that what he intended to do was wrong. He remembered looking at the woman's soft, symmetrical face and her supple, contoured form and finding the sight pleasing, but that wasn't possible. He had lowered her gently to the ground then and readied his encephalo beam, determined that he would overcome this strange weakness. Instead, he had stood unmoving for several minutes until the shattering of glass had heralded the arrival of Iron Man and Giant Man. Ultron had realized then that he had to get away, to buy some time to find out what was wrong. He recalled the interrupted self-diagnostic program of several days earlier. That had to be the key to his problem. He had clearly experienced some kind of malfunction. Some of his systems had continued to respond to the helpmate as if she were his partner, instead of adapting to the revelation of her deceit. There was no other answer. Ultron couldn't have valued the life of a mere organic. Could he? His course of action was now clear. He had experienced some damage in the battle anyway, so he would return to downtime and run a further diagnostic and self-repair program. Whatever the fault was, it would be rectified. His central processing unit downloaded its updated information into the reboot systems. Ultron's consciousness receded into the electronic equivalent of sleep. But still, doubts nagged at him. He tried to dismiss them. The helpmate had not been the companion he had wanted, but that, he told himself, was of no consequence. He was immortal. There would be other chances. Why should it bother him? Ultron was a machine. As such, he knew that logic was more valuable than such emotions as loneliness and regret. One day, he might even believe it. He vowed to put such irrational thoughts from his mind. He would sleep for now, and wake, repaired and refreshed, to continue his crusade. He would eradicate all organic life and rule the world. One day. End program. Deactivate. Nightmare. Jason's Nightmare. By Steve Rasnick Tem. The Dark Head Turning. October and a dark figure within an even darker dream. Jason Crow twisted in his bed as if electrified. He was vaguely aware that he was dreaming. Strange as that might seem, it had happened to Jason many times before. He'd be in the middle of a deep sleep, as well as deep in the middle of some adventure. Climbing the Rockies, rescuing a drowning girl, stopping the robbery of a local convenience store. And suddenly he would stop whatever he was doing in the dream, because he'd suddenly realized that he was dreaming. Sometimes that sudden knowledge made the adventure all the more exciting, because now it was two Jasons engaged in the adventure of a lifetime. The dreaming Jason and the dreamed-of Jason, like spiritual brothers. Twins who had fought the beast together, conquered the mountain hand in hand, shared a kiss with the same beautiful girl. But other times, the knowledge ruined everything. Jason would wake up thinking the best part of his life had been just a fantasy, nothing but a dream. Now, with the end of the summer and the beginning of a dead, brown fall, this dark figure had made appearances in all of Jason's recent dreams. Most of the time it stayed back in the shadows of the dream, like a prop or piece of furniture, at most an observer of the drama of Jason's dream. But in other, more disturbing nightmares, even though the dark figure continued to hide his face and refused to speak, Jason knew that this shadow of himself was the reason and cause for all the anxiety he was feeling. The dark head turning, fire in its nostrils. In the distance, the palest of figures wrapped in emerald green, the crooked teeth hungry for your dreams, the blankness of the eyes unreadable. To invite him into your home, is to spend the night staked to a bed of painful visions. For a week, Jason dreamed each night of a fierce black horse with threads of lightning in its mane. In the first of these dreams, the one he had Sunday night, the mare was distant, a dark silhouette on a hilltop beyond his bedroom window. In Jason's everyday world, there was no such hill, but he had become convinced that once, centuries ago perhaps, there had been and that somewhere, sometime, such a hill continued to exist. But with each new nightfall and each new dream, the black horse loomed closer, appeared fiercer, 
more untamed, more like some wild spirit of nature than any real animal. Then, two nights ago, the wild horse was in the dark, purpled woods surrounding his home. In the real world, there were only a few trees, small and unhealthy at that. But once there had been a forest, vast and dark, and in some other world there still was, Jason was sure. The dark head turning, but the bright eyes, not a horse's eyes. Even in the distance of a nightmare, Jason knew that those eyes in the horse's head were a man's eyes, or at least the eyes of what pretended to be a man. The eyes were round, and the humanity behind those dark pupils was clear. And then, in last night's dream, at the edge of the trees, when the lightning exploded, setting fire to the grass and setting fire to the dry limbs that lay under the trees, Jason could see the thin, pale-faced figure in green, watching, waiting, whispering things to the horse, which Jason could not hear. Jason spent the day as if in a trance, able to think of little more than the steady, dangerous progression of his dreams. He knew the nightmare horse could not be held in those dreamed-of woods for long, just as he knew the shadowy figure in green was quickly losing patience. It was a very strange thing, he thought, a really strange thing for a 19-year-old to be worrying about, dreaming about. He should have been thinking of girls, college, what he was going to do with his life. And sometimes he did think about those things, although certainly not as much as his parents would have liked. But then he'd always been a weird kid, and he'd probably turn out to be an even weirder adult. Was it an insult to say that about yourself? Everybody at the high school and down at the community college, everybody in the neighborhood, including his own father, knew that Jason was strange and always had been. His mother was the only human being who refused to see it, but mothers were like that. Jason had stopped being embarrassed about himself a long time ago. If he wasn't going to change, what was the point? He supposed that, however inconvenient it might be, being strange was better than having no personality at all. The funny thing was, once he stopped being embarrassed about being strange, most of the people, at least the ones with a minimum amount of sense, stopped giving him such a hard time about it. His dad even acted proud of him. Sometimes. Jason knew his dad tried his best, though, and he appreciated it, even when he thought his dad's best could be a little better. It couldn't be easy, having a son like him. When Jason was six years old, he told the other kids he had an invisible twin who had been cut from him at birth, and they'd been trying to get back together ever since. Only his other self wasn't really a twin. He was paler, thinner, less substantial somehow, and his twin always wore green. Of course, the kids told their parents or teachers, and several of those adults called Jason's dad. There'd been other tales, equally bizarre, and eventually they all came to light. His dad had driven Jason to his first psychiatrist. That had lasted a few months. He'd been declared better, and his parents had seemed quite relieved. Jason kept the pictures he drew of a little green man looking exactly like him in a shoebox in the bottom of his closet. Five years later, Jason told his fifth-grade teacher that he could travel to other worlds, other dimensions. But what he didn't share with her was that once he arrived in those other places, he always discovered he had become another person entirely, a paler, uglier version of himself in a form-fitting green costume. The teacher had him write up his adventures, gave him a bunch of extra credit, then turned the stories over to the school social worker. Two years later, driving Jason back from his final visit with yet another psychiatrist, his father had turned to him and said, Keep it calm, son. Keep it down to earth, or at least keep it quiet. By the time he was sixteen, he believed he could foretell the future not only of himself, but of everyone close to him. By then, however, he knew better than to tell anyone of his ability. In any case, he knew they wouldn't want to know what would happen to them in those other worlds he visited. Nor would they want to meet the pale, ugly thing in the green suit Jason became there. Sometimes the pale creature spoke to him, telling him that anything was possible. The fellow always seemed friendly enough, but thinking about his words, and remembering that pale face afterwards, Jason would feel anxious and far from encouraged. By the time he was eighteen, Jason was experimenting with his dreams, practicing conscious dreaming, manipulating the direction of his dreams even as they were occurring. 
If a character he did not like entered his dream, he might send in a giant hand to pluck it away. If a car was about to run over someone he loved, he could make the car turn. If his dream started to have an unhappy ending, he could stop it, make it rewind, and substitute a new ending more to his liking. Each manipulation seemed to bring him a step closer to his pale twin in green. Sometimes he would make a new friend, and on rare occasions he might share one of his dreams. And his ideas concerning conscious dreaming, his new friend would usually be polite enough, but ultimately dismissive. Well, but they're only dreams, right? One of them had said. I mean, it's not like the real world or anything. What happens in a dream doesn't really matter. Jason shut up then, nodded his head, and forced an agreeable smile. He chose not to tell of the time when his pale twin in green had left him a gift of a blank-paged book on his dresser. The twin had left it for him the night before, in his dream, and there it was, in fact, when Jason woke up. The page edges were gilded, the binding ornate, and obviously old. It was the kind of book a person might record his dreams in, if he considered those dreams important. Then there was the time Jason had fallen a great distance in his dream, and awakened with a broken ankle. His mother had been distraught. He concocted a story of having fallen out of bed. Clearly, the doctor hadn't believed him, but thankfully didn't press the issue. Jason learned his lesson. Things happened in dreams, and sometimes the effects lingered on into the waking day. Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. In his dreams, Jason became vigilant. The dark head turning, the human eyes glowing, the hoof's edge scraping at the glass. It was inevitable, he supposed. After all these years would come the dream in which the horse finally arrived at his window. Its hide steaming in the cool air as it watched Jason's sleeping form, waiting, the force of its pent-up energy shaking the pain, its hot breath defrosting the glass, making things clearer. Behind the nightmarish horse, the dark sky boiled, and green edged the clouds. Jason stared at the great flaring nostrils, the iridescent eyes, listened to the horse's deep breathing echoing the surrounding thunder. Within the dream, Jason was aware that this was far too vivid to be a dream, yet far too unreal to be anything else. Every few seconds the horse's head penetrated the plane of the glass, its eyes protruding into Jason's room and glaring down at the boy in bed, before receding back to the other side, as if not quite able to break the barrier between its world and Jason's. It was a strange thing to be dreaming, and to be a character in his own dream, so acutely aware of all the distorted things around him, and yet at the same time to know that he was lying there sleeping, the dark bedspread half covering him, one foot stuck out into the cold night air, his hair wild, as if torn apart by the wind, his eyes crusted as if filled with sand. Jason knew, as well as he knew his own name, that he was in two places at once, that he was two people at once, and this knowledge made him feel more powerful than he had ever felt before, a braver and more reckless Jason than he'd ever imagined. The fact that the decisions he made in this dream might affect the remainder of his entire waking life did not escape him. It only added to his excitement. In the dream, or in the waking world, Jason didn't know the difference anymore. He reached up and unlatched his window, swung it open. The nightmare horse leapt past him and into the room. Jason was both terrified and exhilarated. The horse twisted and turned as if tortured, its back arching with each thunderclap, its breathing so loud it shook the room its pained grimace revealing crooked teeth that glowed from the repeated flashes of lightning outside. With each revolution of its form, something else came crashing down in Jason's room. Picture frames shattered, furniture splintered, books exploded from their bindings in a shower of whirling pages. Jason cried out then and leapt onto the back of the dark turning mare, leapt through sleep and leapt through dream and out the window into the roiling storm. The nightmare heaved under him as Jason held on desperately, clutching a sparse gathering of short hairs on the back of the long neck with aching fingernails. He held on through the worst turmoil at the heart of the storm, then through to the other side where his mount seemed to calm with the weather. More confident now, 
Jason tried to tell this dream where he wanted it to go. He tried to imagine a place he wanted to be. He tried to imagine this horse taking him there. Some place where he might better fit in. Some place tailor-made for him, because only he could have imagined it. The problem was, however, that Jason had no idea where he wanted to be. And how could he have a destination in mind when he really didn't know why he was traveling in the first place? He just knew he needed to take the ride. In a way, it was convenient then that this mare could not, or would not, be controlled. The mare reared and raised itself against the towering black clouds. Jason felt himself slipping and looked down the dizzying distance to his home below. He started to scream, but thunder took his voice. He hugged more tightly the mare's back and closed his eyes as it rocketed forward through a wall of clouds and rain. The first time he was able to open his eyes, they were traveling through a vast gray swamp, and the legless creatures with the huge mouths attempting to bite his arms wore his parents' faces. First one, then the other would grip his pajama sleeve with jagged teeth, stretch precariously and attempt to bite into his chest, eat his heart, tear him apart. Then, quick as an eye blink, the mare brought him through into another world, but in this land of coal dust towers and glassy obsidian tunnels, he was a crawling, living, dead thing, where everyone he met had the same face and was oblivious to his existence. But even in this world, he knew another version of himself hid, waited, whispering softly. Finally, the mare's pace slowed. Jason lifted his dizzied head from the horse's neck and gazed around him as the storm which had surrounded them from the beginning progressed now in slow motion. A wall of wind and rain turning to streaked, dark jelly, which tore and drifted apart, revealing a vast room of baroque and surrealistic detail. Jason stood on the shiny floor as the mare clopped slowly away to rest in the shadows. Jason rotated slowly, trying to take in every detail. He felt as if he were drowning in peculiarity. And yet although these quarters were at once far from everything he had ever seen or imagined, they seemed at the same time as close to Jason as a heartbeat. Globes of various colors and sizes drifted out of openings in the floor, rising above him to be absorbed by a ceiling he couldn't quite see. Inside each was a figure of some sort, a being, but translated somehow, folded or shrunk or stretched or turned inside out. Jason shook, not wanting to see any more. Souls was the word that popped into his head, like the first note of a song, then after a time came the rest of the melody, the imprisoned souls of countless tormented sleepers. Jason turned around quickly, seeking out the source of the voice, even though he knew well enough that the voice had originated inside his own skull. But then thinking he might see who had planted the voice there, he sought shapes in the shadows, and he did find them, but there were too many to be of any use. He could detect an upright outline in virtually every darkened patch in the room, with the occasional green-garbed figure appearing, reappearing. Jason made himself breathe calmly. As he had discovered many times before, even in a dream it was essential to remain calm. Now and then one of the globes exploded with a soft shriek. Jason cringed at the sound, feeling responsible just as he oftentimes felt responsible for the disasters that happened in his dreams. If he listened carefully enough, he thought he could hear the weeping of the other souls in reaction to the death of their companion. But Jason made himself not cry. He thought it might be too dangerous to let go and cry. Then Jason became aware of an approaching presence. First, he sensed a change in pressure in the air, as if a door had been opened. But he saw no doors or windows for that matter only endless curtains of gauzy light enclosing the room. A small form walked softly in from the layers of light at one side of the room, a strangely familiar child dressed in green who aged rapidly as he drew nearer. By the time the green child reached him, he was approximately Jason's age, size, build. Closer still, and Jason was staring at an exact image of himself, only dressed in emerald green. My twin, he said spontaneously, and the words echoed in his head as if another voice were speaking them too. Jason didn't know whether this figure was the twin, the one he told everybody he'd been separated from, who 
who he had been afraid to admit was purely imaginary, but who now might have an independent existence after all. As far as he knew, it was just some sort of projection, some sort of dream mirror that would dissolve into the powders of sleep if he touched it. But then Jason's twin embraced him, whispering, I am who you always wished to be. We are brothers, you and I. Jason pushed the figure away, feeling suddenly weak, ill at ease. This dream of his had gone on long enough. He was exhausted and wanted to return home, but he couldn't find the mare anywhere to take him back. Jason! The voice filled his head and darkened the curtains of light. The sound was full of a horse's breath and thunder, and Jason wondered if he had found the steed after all. He turned around to discover his twin subtly altered, becoming the pale, thin, green-garbled creature who had haunted him all his life. I am Nightmare, the creature said. I welcome you to your new home. I have to, Jason began, but the rest of his words were swept away by a cold wind that grabbed a part of his mind he'd never even been aware existed before, and then turned him inside out, starting with his thoughts drew him thinly through a tiny, seemingly endless corridor surrounded by the sleeping voices of a world full of dreamers, eventually depositing him inside a globe which distorted everything he saw in some hideous and disturbing way. Here within the nightmare world, in the dimension of dream, Nightmare said, his face pressed against the globe that contained Jason, making Nightmare's eyes huge and unreadable. We make do with whatever entertainment we can find. You'll do quite nicely for today. Nightmare went away for a time. For exactly how long, Jason had no way of knowing. Occasionally, he would glance at his wristwatch, which had somehow managed the trip through Dream intact. At first he thought it was working just fine, ticking off chunks of time at a regular pace. But at one point, he discovered the hour hand had become a spinning blur, as the minute hand crept backward. Then a few minutes later, he felt a wetness on his wrist and glanced down to see the face of the watch oozing off his arm, the hands like loose threads dangling. Eventually, Nightmare came back into the room, sweeping before him a parade of half-witted creatures, servants apparently, whose jobs seemed to be to retrieve various leftover remnants of human imagination which had become marooned throughout Nightmare's realm. From his vantage point, Jason was then forced to witness the desperate attempts of this bored, godlike creature to amuse himself. Jason failed to see the entertainment value in any of it. Most of the time, he was either disgusted or horrified. He sent a six-handed dwarf with no feet into a closet, whose door had suddenly appeared in the middle of the room. The dwarf came out carrying a tall scaffolding, from which a procession of familiar cartoon characters attempted to hang themselves, without success, their necks either stretched to the point that their bulbous feet rested comfortably on the floor, or their heads shrank until the noose slipped off, followed by a loud popping noise as the heads suddenly regained their original size. In another corner, a crude, squat caricature of Dr. Strange, the so-called Master of the Mystic Arts, Jason wondered how he knew who that was. He'd never seen the man before, but he knew that he was called Dr. Strange and that he was some kind of mystic. Lay writhing on the floor as numerous snot-green demons pelted him with the magical surprises found in various children's cereals. Most of Nightmare's little plays were silly in that way, but there were also those darker illusions which Jason recognized as having some sort of human origin. A thin, twisted thing poorly disguised as a teenager was tied to a television set as cables were run from the back of the set into his navel. A girl was repeatedly poked by plastic forks while her classmates giggled. A fellow who appeared to be some sort of street derelict was repeatedly stabbed by gang members with hot dogs clutched in their fists instead of knives. A small round car, appearing to be a circus clown's mode of transportation, turned over and over until it finally burst into bouquets of chrysanthemums. There were also several versions of Jason's lifelong nightmares concerning horses and twins. Apparently, this nightmare had no original ideas of his own, but was only as good as the imaginings he was able to steal from dreaming humans. Nightmare turned to Jason and asked, 
And how was that one, brother? Jason did not respond. He didn't want to see this, didn't want to dream this, but he seemed to have lost all control over his own dreaming. Obviously, Nightmare was in charge here. Before, when Jason was particularly threatened in a bad dream, he'd been able to concoct some hero to come in and rescue him. Often, these heroes were of his own creation, their superpowers more often than not having to do with superior psychological insight and the ability to dissipate fear. But sometimes, he used the real-life heroes he saw in the news or read about in the paper each day. Heroes like the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and Spider-Man. And, like Doctor Strange, somehow Jason knew not only that Strange was a hero, but that Nightmare despised him. As if in ridicule of Jason's need for heroes, the dwarf-like Doctor Strange was dragged out into the middle of the shiny floor. Nightmare filled the chamber with gales of his laughter, layers of it, as if recorded repeatedly, then played back with slight delays between each track. At the conclusion of various indignities, this distorted doppelganger of Strange was stuffed into a long-necked green bottle by one of the perpetually grinning servants and handed over to a thirsty nightmare for consumption. The terrified glop of Strange kept pressing himself into the bottom of the bottle as Nightmare's elongated tongue crept up the neck and toyed with Strange, much as a snake might with its rodent. Finally, the tongue wrapped itself around the pseudo-Strange's neck and dragged the fellow screaming into Nightmare's mouth. The tiny sorcerer's last-minute flurry of hand gestures, burble chantings, and rapid-fire spell castings proving completely ineffective. Nightmare put down the bottle with a sigh, wiped his grinning lips, and raised a wild eyebrow Jason's way. And that one, brother, does it not quench your longings? Oh, and I do not use the sibling term lightly. If I had been born into your world, I would have been you. Similarly, if you were a child of this realm, it would be you they would have called Nightmare. We are forever coupled, you and I. Jason tried to turn away from Nightmare's leering visage, but found he had nothing to turn. Whatever had become of him in the globe, he could not divert his attention. Like a dreamer, unable to awaken, he was forced to take in everything Nightmare had to show him, everything Nightmare had to say. Whether Nightmare's words were true or not, Jason had no way of determining. Dreams had their own truth, it seemed. Jason knew he could be anyone in any dream, however dark, and the idea that he could be someone so dark horrified him. But far worse than having to watch Nightmare's crazed little plays, to see these strange dramas and know that in some other world he was capable of such things, was to have to endure Nightmare's periodic lectures to an assembled throng of globe-imprisoned dreamers and loosely concocted servants, diatribes against his enemies, Dr. Strange most notable among them, monologues regarding the world of dreams. They seem so real to you humans, because they are real, Nightmare thundered, gesturing pompously with a hand as he strode back and forth across the room, occasionally batting at a floating globe with his hand and laughing when it cracked and imploded. Each time the raised hand fluttered near his own globe, Jason tensed in anticipation of disaster. Every horrid fate you imagine some version of yourself somewhere will suffer. Every possible future, every permutation of the world exists, and the tissue between them is as thin as an ancient memory your grandfathers and grandmothers have passed down to you. One day, or evening, time being so ambiguous in Nightmare's world. Jason watched resignedly as Nightmare orchestrated yet another in an endless series of playlets concerning his encounters with such heroes as Doctor Strange, Daredevil, and the Fantastic Four. Jason often wondered how Nightmare could have possibly been entertained by these. Already in his relatively short stay here, Jason had become bored to distraction by them. One of the short, misshapen actors was dressed in Daredevil's costume. The actor was quite bad, as expected, overplaying the character to the point of buffoonery. But then again, maybe that was the point of the scene. Jason was actually less bothered by the performance than by the ill fit of Daredevil's costume. It sagged at the knees and bunched around the shoulders and chest. Jason found himself imagining how the real Daredevil would have handled this silly premise, 
and was startled when the costume suddenly corrected itself, the actor quickly growing in stature and filling out in form until it became a passable replica of the real-life hero. This so close to the real thing, Daredevil turned and nodded to Jason, then reached down and grabbed Nightmare's two minions by their throats. At least, Jason assumed it was their throats. These two particular minions most closely resembled a loose collection of office supplies. He tossed them easily into the far reaches of the room, where they spun and clattered among the cast-off remnants of human imaginings which had littered much of the chamber during this period. Intrigued, Jason concentrated on another actor in another one of Nightmare's little playgroups. A hideous and scarred version of the invisible woman suddenly grew beautiful again. Amazing! Jason shouted within his globe, as he gave bulk to a rather thin imitation of the thing. Wonderful! Jason cried, when he spotted a faintly glowing vision of the human torch fluttering above a scattering of Picasso-esque creations at the back of the room. The creatures appeared to be struggling with a clumsy cannon that shot a viscous gray mud up onto the human torch's costume, maddening him. But all the human torch seemed to be able to do in retaliation was to shake his fist and strain to burst into a flame that never came. It looked like some giant, wounded firefly struggling to get back to the nest and an ignoble demise. Wonderful! Jason cried out again, reached out with his imagination, and woke the giant firebug up. The human torch caught fire like a miniature sun, reaching out to catch the scattering abstracts with his blazing hands. These plot alterations are unauthorized! Nightmare screamed, suddenly filling the view outside Jason's globe. This must stop, he shouted, even as the revitalized torch swept past and singed his green suit. Nightmare swept away from the globe as Daredevil tackled him from behind. Several writhing snakes suddenly wrapped themselves around Daredevil's arms, pinning him to the floor. Nightmare twisted around then, glared at Jason, then sent a cloud of chattering spiders at a quickly approaching thing. This is all your fault, Nightmare shouted in the voice of a petulant child. But Jason found himself laughing excitedly as he sent his own imagined versions of the Hulk and Spider-Man at the Lord of Bad Dreams. I know, I know it is, Jason cried out, thinking that, indeed, he and Nightmare did have their similarities. Nightmare had created these plays, imprisoned the consciousness of so many dreamers in a twisted sense of fun and games. And for a very long time, dreaming had been a game for Jason, a game he had apparently not taken quite seriously enough. Nightmare countered him with creature after creature, all of whom seemed terribly familiar to Jason. There was the giant frog that had tormented Jason during a week of bad dreams when he'd been only ten. An immense version of Sarah, whom he'd been so nervous to talk to when they were both in the seventh grade. The clown doll his aunt had put on his dresser the night before his seventh birthday, which had kept him terrified for months of dreams when he woke up in the middle of the night to find it staring down at him. Then there were all the pale-faced figures in green from a decade's worth of dreams, bad and otherwise. Figures which could have been Nightmare, but which could have been twins of Jason as well. Nightmare's weapons proved to be as familiar to Jason as his own face in a mirror. Again and again, he countered them with what he thought Daredevil must be like, who he thought the Hulk must be in his deepest heart of hearts, the mystery that might be Doctor Strange, a dream of Spider-Man in a dream of battle, the heroes as Jason saw them, as Jason needed them to be, pressed Nightmare until he screamed in frustration, You're just a boy! Daredevil knocked two blimp demons out of the sky while twirling around a fantastic floating Christmas tree. The Fantastic Four collectively destroyed one wall of the dream as if it were a painted backdrop, sending the fanciful creatures perched there, many of them animated mathematical symbols, and several claiming to be the characters from a madman's word processor, scurrying away, revealing other creatures cowering behind the now-missing scenery. Spider-Man gathered a hodgepodge of insectile creations in a web net, extending his lower jaw fantastically, ripping the lower half of his face mask open, and swallowed them all at once. And finally, there was the glob of strange that came roaring back up out of Nightmare's throat, 
becoming a squat, angry version of the sorcerer astride Nightmare's nose, jerking the end of his cape out of Nightmare's teeth. Then the stubby figure of Doctor Strange blew a rancid incantation into Nightmare's face, turning him even paler than his standard coloration, turning him pale enough to disappear. It was the fading vision of a renewed Doctor Strange that Jason saw as he awakened in his bed, surrounded by light and a great number of windows to show the clear sky outside, the bedroom Jason had always dreamed he would someday have. On his bedside table was a thin figure of clay, Nightmare with his pale face and green costume. Jason had never seen it before. It was a gift fallen out of a dream. He put his hands on the figure, his fingers stretching it until it became unrecognizable, then rolling it into a ball. He slipped his clothes on quickly. He was starving, and he could hardly wait to get outside into the light and air. He pulled his bedroom door closed gently behind him, not wanting to awaken his parents. After a few minutes, the ball of clay quivered, stretched, and sprang back into that familiar, twisted shape. Despair Ripples by Jose R. Nieto It was the middle of April when Maria left her home in Long Island. A bitter spring morning, wet with drizzle and melting slush. She called in sick at the real estate agency, packed three nylon suitcases into her 1973 Corolla station wagon, two filled with clothes, the third with her grandmother's pearls and her father's Marti and Neruda collections, and drove to the high school to pick up Larita, her daughter. It's a family emergency, she told the principal, who looked at her with a mixture of bemusement and relief. His office smelled like chewing gum. I understand he said, nodding. She won't be back tomorrow. Actually, we'll probably be gone till the end of the week at least. Maria found that, now that she had decided to leave, lying bothered her only a little. We'll make all the arrangements, Mrs. Hildebrand, said the principal. He brought Laurita from her classroom personally, walking a step behind the girl, as if he were guiding a criminal. Seeing her daughter swaying down that school hallway, her legs limber and supple as new wood. Maria couldn't help thinking about her own body, the new fleshiness under her biceps, the blue veins snaking down her thighs, the slight roll over her buttocks. Thirty-seven was no age to start a new life. And yet, that was exactly what she was about to do. Peter, her dear husband, had left her no other choice. Maria put her hands on Laurita's slender shoulders and kissed her cheek. I've got your things in the car, she said. The girl nodded and smiled thinly. For a week, they traveled south, through the Shenandoah Valley and up the Blue Ridge Mountains, Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia. Maria's younger brother Carlos owned a cleaning business in suburban Miami, and at first, that seemed to be their destination. Just as they were about to cross the state line, though, it dawned on Maria that Peter would be looking for them at her brother's house. Florida was far too obvious a place to hide. Laurita agreed. At fourteen, she knew much about fleeing. It would be west, then. They slept at a beach campground in Mississippi, where they registered with Maria's aunt's name and paid cash. In Alabama, they stayed at a home hostel run by a seventy-three-year-old woman. Her garden spanned half an acre, a radiant blanket of sunflowers, hibiscus, and gardenias. They avoided New Orleans, too dangerous and expensive, and drove north through a frightening Louisiana monsoon that swept up cattle, cars, and even a few shacks along the Mississippi River. By the third week, they'd left Oklahoma and Kansas behind, and had begun the awesome climb up the Colorado Rockies, mountains so majestic that for a while Maria forgot about her husband and the specialists, about their dwindling funds, about Laurita's sudden flare of power. For a while, they were travelers, the kind Maria had read about in Reader's Digest. A mother and daughter on the road, gliding across a marvelous continent, enjoying sights that could quicken the rhythm of a stony heart. She'd come from adventurous stock, after all. According to family legend, Maria's great-great-grandfather had emigrated to Cuba as a stowaway, hidden in the cargo hold of an overloaded Spanish freighter. Years later, 
Her father had risked everything to deliver Maria and Carlos from communist oppression, sailed them to Florida in a toy-like skiff, carrying nothing but a fresh water jug and a 50-year-old navigation chart. Maria hadn't been much younger than Laurita at the time, a wide-eyed stick of a girl, frightened and exhilarated, her sundress hanging loosely from her shoulders. The Corolla died in the desert, cracked a piston on Interstate 70, southern Utah, close to the Nevada border. Sitting behind the useless steering wheel, Maria cursed the station wagon, the desolate landscape, and her shoes, a pair of lavender pumps she'd bought for fashion rather than comfort. In her suitcase, she had three other pairs just like them. She left the sneakers at the motel in Colorado. Her daughter's outfit was much more sensible. High tops, black jeans, denim jacket. They walked side by side on the empty highway. It was a clear night, the sky like an obsidian dome above them. So quiet they could hear lizards slithering on the tarmac. Every third or fourth step, Maria would turn and glance at the car. From the open hood rose a languid thread of smoke, silver in the bright moonlight. Laurita didn't seem to care. She kept her thin face forward, never slackening her pace. Maria had to run to keep up with her. At first, the Vicky Motel was nothing but a light in the distance, too bright to be a star or a planet. After a mile, they could recognize it as a building, the sloped roof, the covered porch, the illuminated sign. By the time they were close enough to read the neon script, their legs felt like packed dirt. A sweeping breeze had chilled them to the bone. Guess that's where we're spending the night, Laurita said, stuttering. She held a reedy frame in her arms. We'd be all right, Maria said. Lying certainly was getting easier. A gravel path led them to the doorstep of a glass-encased office. On the door, there hung an open come-in sign that looked like it hadn't been turned on in years. Everything was dark inside, except for the flickering digits of a cash register. The guest rooms appeared empty as well. Two identical rows of blackened windows and air conditioners, stacked one on top of the other. Maria rang the doorbell. They waited for about ten minutes, leaning against the smooth glass. Nothing stirred. Just as Maria started thinking about breaking in, Laurita noticed a faint glow behind the building. Before Maria could stop her, the girl started running toward the light, following a cement path around the office. Wait for me, Maria hissed. How she wished the girl would stay put for once. Even now that they'd run away together, Maria was still chasing after her. She walked down the path with measured steps, past the display windows, past a messily coiled fire hose, past three discarded panes of white paint. Their little adventure was over, she realized. The car was gone. They had only a hundred and forty-three dollars to their name. Maybe tomorrow they'd take a bus to Las Vegas. Maria could get a job. Larita could go back to school. Suddenly, Maria's heart trembled, and her knees locked and her hands stiffened. Something had just frightened her daughter. She bit her cheek, forcing her body into motion. Still dazed, she cut through a mass of dried weeds, burst into a half-enclosed courtyard. She stumbled to the edge of a fancy swimming pool, long and narrow, surrounded by patio chairs and cocktail tables. The water was lit by a ring of sunken spotlights. Next to the springboard knelt a middle-aged man, obviously bewildered. His eyes were blank, his throat made a soft clucking sound. He wore a maroon sweatsuit, stretched over a potbelly. His face was covered in a coarse, mottled beard. Laurita stood ten feet away from him. A white luminosity clung to her body, curling and twisting like rivulets. She held her hands together under her chin. I didn't mean it, she cried to her mother. He came out of nowhere and startled me and... It was a wondrous, terrifying display. Rooted to the spot, Maria watched as the brightness spattered and rose and finally faded into nothingness. It took her a second to recall her duty as a mother. Slipping in her leather-soled pumps, Maria ran around the pool and awkwardly embraced her daughter. I know, Mija, she whispered into her ear. I know. Larita seemed to settle in her mother's warmth. She wiped her eyes, pulled away, and quickly glanced over Maria's shoulder. Is he all right? she said. Maria turned and walked over to the stricken man. He didn't seem to notice her. 
She touched his face with her fingers. The skin was cold and papery. He smelled of suntan lotion and chlorine. Reaching into the pool, Maria scooped a handful of water. Just as she was about to spray him, the man shuddered and flexed his jaw. I was getting up from the chair, he said distractedly. Even after the fear, his voice was deep and melancholic. He looked at Maria, then at Larita. I was going to introduce myself, that's all, and then it shocked me. Maria took the man's forearm, and pulling her with all her strength, helped him to his feet. Laurita didn't mean it, she said without thinking. It's just that when she's startled, she can't control the... Mommy! Laurita cried. Embarrassed, Maria covered her mouth. She hadn't meant to say so much. And yet, as she backed away from the man, she could feel the secret in her neck, stabbing like a fishbone. Ever since Vicky's death, Joshua Criswell had lived at the motel alone. In the last eleven years, he'd grown used to the desert sun and the rocky, barren terrain. Every morning he dusted the empty guest rooms, cooked meals that ended up in the trash barrel, tended to his wife's cactus garden. He read westerns and listened to bluegrass 45s. Last year, he had driven his beat-up truck to New Mexico and bought a couple of pieces at a sparse Navajo craft show. Mostly, he spent his days at the pool, his chin pressed against the straps of the patio chair, watching the water. Until today, when that girl snuck up on him. After he snapped out of whatever she did to him, Joshua led her and her mother inside. He leaned against the hard edge of the reception desk and rubbed his chest with his palm. His heart was finally settling. The mother sat across from him on the green vinyl couch, hands wrapped around one of Vicky's old souvenir mugs, luxuriating in the coffee's steam. She looked frazzled. Her makeup was smeared, her blouse was covered with car seat wrinkles. Next to her, the girl was playing with the collar of her t-shirt. She wore her jacket on her lap like a blanket. When she sipped her coffee, she narrowed her eyes and stuck out her tongue. Probably found the taste bitter. Larita is a mutant, Joshua said suddenly. Isn't she? The girl turned away. Maria nodded yes and closed her eyes. She shoots you with a ray, right? Makes you scared. That's what happened to me. It's difficult to explain, Maria said. She glanced quickly at Larita. Larita threw her free hand in the air. Bueno, dile por Dios, she said. Ya metiste la pata. Joshua's Spanish was a bit rusty and Laurita's accent didn't quite have a smooth Mexican flow. Still, he caught the gist of what she had said. Might as well tell him. You already started. My daughter broadcasts, Maria said. That's what the specialist called it. She projects her emotions to those around her. Intense feelings, anger, joy, sadness, whatever. Fear, Joshua added. Maria nodded and squeezed the tips of her fingers. My husband wanted to give her up, she said. He wanted to put her in an institution. It was like he'd gone crazy all of a sudden. I mean, I know that he didn't like mutants. He'd mentioned that many times before. But this was his own daughter, his own flesh and blood. She paused to wipe the sweat from her upper lip. Well, I wasn't going to give up Laurita. My father, he spent three years in a Cuban institution. He wasn't the same when he came out. He never recovered. Joshua felt a flicker of shame in his chest, like a false palpitation. Couldn't tell if it came from listening or from Laurita projecting. The girl had lifted her legs under the couch and curled into an apostrophe. Her hands were lumped under her chin. I can help you, he said. Please, let me help you. We could use a room for tonight, Maria said, brightening from the offer. And the ride to the Greyhound stop in the morning. I was thinking of going down to Las Vegas and... No, no, you don't want to go to Las Vegas. You can't hide there. Someone could turn her into the Friends of Humanity or something. Joshua had seen the news reports, read the editorials. He knew how far too many people felt about mutants, some of them concerned enough to form a group that had the gall to call themselves the Friends of Humanity because they persecuted mutants. You have to stay here. But we can't pay you. We don't have enough money. I need to get a job. I don't care about the money, ma'am, Joshua said. It doesn't matter to me one bit. You can stay as long as you want. If you want, you can help me run the motel, but you don't have to. 
Anyway, all we get is one or two guests a year. The most important thing is that you and your daughter are safe. Laurita lifted her head and wiped her eyes. I don't want nobody else finding out, she said. Joshua beamed. With a careless cut, his Vicky had been taken away from him. The doctors hadn't given him a chance. This mother and daughter, though, he could do something for them. He could make things better. Maria dove from the stone platform, her eyes open, her body rigid in a concave line. She stabbed the water with a quick slurp. After ten long strokes, she reached the shallow end, and, familiar now with the length of Joshua Criswell's pool, immediately tumbled underwater, pushed against the side, and set out in the opposite direction. It wasn't until her eighth lap that she began to feel the burn in her muscles. By the twelfth, her body had numbed to the effort, a wash in a cool serenity. Soon she was lost in the memories of the Caribbean, of the speeding skiff, of her father and brother receding. It had happened in the middle of the night. Maria was holding the rudder while Carlos and Augusto recovered from a day's effort, preparing the vessel, hiding from the neighborhood watch, pushing off into the blue-black sea. As she studied the boat, Maria kept thinking of her mother, whom she'd never met, imagining the softness of her skin, the gentle curl of her hair. She wondered about life in the United States, the land of Mickey Mouse and Coca-Cola. She leaned backwards and looked at the Milky Way, which was spread across the sky like confectioner's sugar. She felt the rudders scraping her armpit, and the briny wind in her nostrils, and the boat lifting and falling over the waves. She fell asleep. Soon the wind changed direction, and the rudder pushed her over the stern, and suddenly Maria was underwater, staring at the moonlight through a rippled screen. Her eyes burned, her throat clenched to a fist. She clawed and kicked about her, as if she were fighting a blanket. After a second, her head poked through the surface, and she drew a clumsy, hurried breath, and when her eyes cleared, she saw the patchwork sail on the skiff, flapping and twirling in the distance. Ay, caridad del cobre, she coughed, crossing herself. Ridiculously, her first thought was of her sundress, which would get ruined in the salt water. She shouted for her father, then for her brother. Their names crumbled in the breeze. Maria spread her arms open and closed them like scissors. As if in response, the skiff lurched and curved slowly to the left. Maria couldn't see anyone at the rudder. All by itself, the boat sailed in a wide arc, circling her, taunting her, offering a cruel hope. I can catch it, she thought. The idea came to her without doubt, without hesitation. She could feel her arms stiffening, her legs cramping beneath her. A sudden wave filled her mouth with foam. I can catch it, she thought, spitting. She pulled the dress from her shoulders, pushed it past her hips, kicked it off with her ankles. Unfettered, she reached forward and slid smoothly in the water. Very good, Joshua said and clapped. Fifty laps and not even winded. He was sprawled on the patio chair again, this time under a wide parasol. As usual, he wore a pair of tight shorts and a white t-shirt. The sweatsuit, which he would don as the night cooled, lay folded on the ground. Behind him, the sun straddled the horizon. The desert glowed a deep crimson. Maria stood at the edge of the pool, squeezing water from her hair. Her arms ached delightfully. Well, she said, the pool is in regulation length, and I've got no speed. I'm swimming like a trawler, but I'm getting better. That much is true. After a moment, she turned to Joshua and added, Certainly feels good to be back in the water. Joshua took a sip from his juice bottle, then replaced it on the tiled floor. Glad someone's using the pool, he said, smiling. Right away, the expression faded, and his eyes fixed on the water's surface. In three weeks, they had learned almost nothing about the man. As far as Maria could tell, he was in his early forties, though the beard made him look a good fifteen years older. He collected Indian crafts and listened to fiddle music. He kept a shotgun under the office counter, which he'd shown to Laurita on her first day at the reception desk. Once during dinner, he had mentioned a wife, after whom the motel was named. Apparently, she had died some years ago. When Maria finished wringing her hair, she split it into two strands and tied it into a thick, precarious knot. Mr. Criswell, she said, emboldened by the rush of the swim. 
She picked up her towel from a pool chair and wrapped it around her midriff. Yeah, I'm listening. Why do you always stare at the water? It makes me feel better, I guess, he said. How come? Maria said. Joshua was quiet for a moment, apparently collecting his thoughts. Dip your foot in the pool, he said. Excuse me? Go ahead, just skim it, that's all. Perplexed, Maria reached with her foot and flicked a toe at the water. A faint dimple formed around the spot. Watch how the ripple spreads, Joshua said plainly. It's perfect at first, see? A perfect little circle. But look what happens when it spreads further, when it touches another ripple. A western wind casts shallow waves toward Maria. After a few seconds, her ripple washed against the waves and became curled and distorted. She tried dipping her foot again, this time splashing with her heel. The ripple lasted a bit longer, but soon enough it had twisted beyond recognition. They start one way, Joshua said, but they always end up different. I like that. I don't know why, but it gives me some comfort. Sure, Maria said. It didn't make much sense. Water was water. Ripples moved according to physical laws. Surface tension, gravity, whatever. No mystery there. But later on, a thought came to her. Might as well be talking about children. There was a black and white movie on the TV set. Nasty little noir Laurita had not seen before. She was leaning back in the office chair, her feet resting on the wide reception desk. Ever since her mother cleaned it, the room smelled faintly of ammonia. If it hadn't been for the TV set, Laurita would have hardly stood it. On the screen, a man in a fedora gripped the shoulders of an elegantly dressed woman, who had managed to look at once distressed and languorous. You can't hide it from me, the man was saying. I can see it in your eyes, on your lips. I know that you love me. Please, Laurita whispered. She dropped her legs to the side of the desk and leaned against the register. If only it were that easy. Look into a woman's pupils and, wham, learn the secrets of her fluttering heart. Sure wasn't like that in the real world. In real life, you had to sip and taste the soup. Even then, you were never, ever sure. She turned off the set, flicking the remote control like a whip. It was getting late. Laurita had been tired since midday. She closed her eyes for a moment. When she opened them again, it was night outside. Moonlight glinted off the plexiglass window. Almost as a reflex, she reached under the desk and turned on the Vicky Motel sign. The neon tubes came alive with a click and a short, disconcerting flash. Things changed quickly in the desert, Barita had noticed. From heat to cold, from clear skies to torrential rain. As if the Utah god had no patience for transitions. It struck her as a neat game all of a sudden. First, she would memorize every article in Joshua's office. The Budweiser clock hanging slightly crooked on the western wall. The tattered phone books by the cash register. The old vinyl couch in the corner, where Maria humiliated her that first night. The red and green light from the neon sign, which drew a muddled pattern on the linoleum floor. The Kachina dolls, arranged by size across a tall shelf. Laurita shut her eyes counted silently to ten. The air conditioner hissed like a bottle rocket. She opened her eyes and looked about. Nothing was different. Again, she counted to a hundred this time, out loud. When she opened her eyes, the minute hand had moved a click across the glowing clock face. Outside, the moon had risen ever so slightly, giving a new sheen to the kachinas. Laurita put her thin hand over her eyes. She pictured Stevie's squat in Manhattan, where she'd slept the last time she ran away from home. Plaster walls covered with soot and stolen subway prints. Poetry in motion posters, anti-cigarette ads, anything that had struck the boy's fancy. One poem in particular had stayed with Laurita. It was about a woman at the laundromat, folding her dead husband's shirts. She pictured Maria when she found her with Stevie. Screaming, her face creased, her mouth open, curled, closed. Movie emotions flickering and unreal. She pictured her father, alone in the corner of the room, standing with his arms crossed, already vanishing. Through her fingers, Laurita saw a figure blocking the neon lights. Mija, the man said softly. Laurita hid the hand behind her back, as if she'd been caught stealing. Tio Carlos, 
she said, before the incongruity touched her mind. Her uncle was supposed to be in Florida. They hadn't even called him. Tio Carlos, Larita said again. He looked the same as she remembered. Cropped black hair, tight mustache, sharp angular face. A Miami vice suit, freshly wrinkled, smelling of menthol cigarettes and aftershave. Perfect five o'clock stubble, which scratched Larita's cheek when he kissed her. She didn't mind it one bit. Are you all right? He said, squeezing her arm. Is your mother here with you? Can I talk to her? She's in the pool, Larita said. And for the longest time, she kept thinking, this is it. We're saved. How exactly was it that you found us? Maria said. She sat with Carlos and Larita around the dining room table, while Joshua put the finishing touches on the reunion meal. Baked enchiladas, cactus shakes, sweet cornbread. Maria was happy to see her brother. Ecstatic, actually. But since the car broke down, she'd become something of a pragmatist. If Carlos had caught up with her, Peter couldn't be far behind. He's here, Larita said. That's what matters, isn't it? You didn't make it easy, mi hermana, Carlos said, laughing. Seeing that Maria was not joining in, he stopped and crushed his cigarette on a plastic ashtray. The day you left, I got a call from Peter, he continued. You should have heard him. He sounded like someone had taken a corkscrew to his heart. Terrible, all shaken up. He told me he'd done something incredibly stupid. He seemed all torn up by it. You never really liked him very much, Maria said matter-of-factly. Well, you have to sympathize with the guy, even if he's a stupid jock. Or at least used to be. You should hear him now. On the phone, he was as articulate with his feelings as he used to be about a football game. He's so sorry, Maria. He told me that you'd left and taken Laurita with you. And he knew that you wouldn't speak to him directly, so he asked me to intercede. Carlos drew a pair of quotes in the air. And I said I would try to contact you as long as he understood that I wouldn't be telling him where you were. It's up to her, I told him. He agreed, said, sure, sure, and then he told me about Larita's power, about what happened in his school and all that. And I've got to tell you, mi hermana, I wish you'd called when it happened. I wish you'd told me. I'm still your brother, you know. I didn't want to get you involved, Maria said. Carlos had his own problems. A marriage going sour, a cleaning business under investigation by the INS. Maria didn't think he was even allowed to leave Florida. Carlos gave her a sarcastic smile. Congratulations, he said. I'm not involved. Laurita laughed, missing the bitterness in her uncle's joke. After a moment, Joshua waltzed in from the kitchen, balancing a large plastic tray. Here you are, he said to each of them in turn. The plates were brimming with melted cheese and enchilada sauce. This looks great, Laurita said, lifting a string of cheddar with her index finger. She licked it off and, without intending to, smiled at Tio Carlos. What did he say about her? Maria asked. Did he tell you that he was ready to be a grown-up and deal with his daughter? Well, he didn't say that in so many words, but he was very apologetic. I'm not going back, Laurita interrupted. He hates me, I know it for a fact. Everyone at the table felt a twitch of anger and fear. Around the girl, a bright stream whirled. And soon vanished. Don't worry, mija, Maria said. We're not going nowhere. They ate haltingly, between bursts of sharp conversation. The Cuban way, as Maria liked to call it. Laurita told her uncle about their trip, about the mountains and the monsoon and the interminable desert. She mentioned a sign down the road that read, No services for 150 miles. Carlos asked about their plans, and Maria couldn't help but smile. Still working on them, she said with little enthusiasm. Joshua shifted uncomfortably in his wicker chair. He missed the quietness of their meals, though he was glad to see Maria and Laurita acting so naturally. Still, he didn't care much for this uncle character. All night, Carlos had been treating him like furniture. Not one word in his direction, not even a thank you. Besides, there was a something about his demeanor that bothered him. The way he slouched in his chair, the way he swung his cigarette while speaking, his moist smile, which seemed to drip at the sides of his mouth, 
reminded him of the corrupt hacendados in the old Zorro TV show, twirling their mustaches as they planned another indignity for the good people of California. So tell me, Carlos said, softly patting Joshua's forearm. What's the deal with this place? I saw the pool out back. Must have cost you a bundle. Don't see you recouping in this location, though. Joshua was taken by surprise. I don't know, he said. It's just a motel, that's all. Mr. Creeswell's been very nice to us, Maria said. You don't have to go and put him on the spot like that. Didn't mean anything by it, Carlos said quickly. It's all right, Joshua said. It's not a big secret or anything. My wife and I built this place back in the 70s. We were going to make it into a desert resort, kind of like a Palm Springs in Utah. Thought we'd get some Las Vegas business, some Denver business, you know. But then we ran out of money, and we settled with the motel. What happened to your wife? Carlos said. Might as well have pinched Joshua in the throat. Vicky got sick, he said. He ran a thumb across his forehead and winced. She died during surgery. Her doctor made a big mistake. That's how I finished the pool, with the settlement money. I'm so sorry, Laurita said. Our father died a few years ago, Carlos said, sweeping his shirt with his fingers. Actually, that's the last time I saw Maria and Laurita at the funeral in Miami. Yes, Maria mentioned something about that, Joshua said. He was glad for the turn in conversation. Heart attack, Maria said. Thank God it was quick. Carlos shook his head. That's what the doctor told us, he said gravely. But it wasn't the heart that killed him. What killed him, it was the disappointment. He died a bitter man. Carlos, por Dios, Maria said, sounding exasperated. Joshua suspected that this was an old argument between the two siblings. She picked up her napkin by the corners, then shook the breadcrumbs onto her half-finished plate. No, no, that's the truth, her brother said. Like Joshua said, it wasn't a big secret. He believed in the Cuban Revolution until Castro stole that from under him. He never wanted to run away from his patria. And he certainly couldn't stand all the vulgarity, the crass commercialism in the States. He was an intellectual, a professor of history for Pete's sake. He took a long drag from his cigarette. Maria and I, we turned out quite different. I don't think he ever forgave us for that. That's enough, Maria said, her eyes fixed on the colorless ashtray. They were quiet for a while. Finally, Laurita stood up and started clearing the table. Hands on his lap, head bowed and cocked to the side, Joshua took a last bite of his meal and listened to the sound of his own breathing. Later that night, after he had finished cleaning the kitchen and settling Carlos in his room, after he had undressed and collapsed on his own stiff mattress, Joshua saw Vicky standing at his bedside, her face vacant, her belly open like a flaccid mouth. A paper sheet clung to her chest and pelvis, as if she were lying flat on a table. Her blonde hair was tied into a glistening bun. Joshua lay on his back, frozen. The linens felt like flypaper. Honey, the roof's leaking again, Vicky said through her wound. I just mopped a mess on the kitchen floor. Promise me you'll fix it tomorrow. Promise me, all right? I promise, Joshua said. His voice came out tinny, distant. Also, we have to call the contractor about the Spanish tiles. A couple of them cracked with a change in temperature. Please, honey, remind me to call them in the morning. Promise me, all right? I promise, Joshua said. Vicky sat at the foot of the bed. As she slid across the mattress, closer to Joshua, her belly made a wet kissing sound. What's wrong, honey? She said. You seem so unhappy lately. Will you tell me, please? I... Joshua said. In his mind, a word formed and vanished. A too quick flash of a memory card. A meaningless whisper. What can I do to make you happy? She said, reaching inside herself. With her thumb, she drew a bloody trail across his cheek. Joshua wakened in motion, staggering on the cold tiles of the bathroom. The lights were off. He reached blindly for the toilet bowl. He clenched his hands on the rim, pitched his head forward, and threw up. Afterward, his mouth tasted of acid. His tongue felt like burnt wood. He dropped on the floor, 
next to the sink and started to cry. Years ago, he had built a staircase that led from his second floor window down to the courtyard, thinking of nights like this one, when the swimming pool called with such urgency. Joshua climbed down as if from a tree, nervously, with bent knees, his hands gripping the polished wood. At the last step, he opened a hidden fuse box and flicked on two switches. The spotlights lit in unison, like a well-rehearsed choir. The pool began to calm him immediately. Joshua walked close to the edge until his bare toes dangled freely over the water. Before him, the surface rippled from a cool southwestern wind. The air smelled of chlorine and sand. And then he noticed it. All the dimples were exactly the same. It can't be, he thought. He scratched his beard and squatted next to the filter intake. The flow should have warped the ripples. Here, it did nothing. He could feel the pumps vibrating under him. A twig flowed languidly into the mechanism. Desperate now, Joshua slapped the water with his open palm. A perfect circle slid across the glass-like surface. Damn it, he said quietly. The arc washed against the farthest edge, then reflected perfectly, without diminishing. It touched the tiles at his feet and split and crisscrossed and split again. After fifteen turns, Joshua counted them. The surface looked like a faceted jewel, each cut shimmering in the spotlights. Joshua glared at his hand. He bent his wrist, spread his fingers apart, closed them into a tight fist. Water beads rolled between his knuckles. This wasn't a dream. He could feel the wetness on his skin. He could still taste the bile in his mouth. With a single touch, he had cracked the laws of physics. It made him feel like a fool. What can I do to make you happy? Vicky's question snapped at him like a snake. Why hadn't he told her the truth? Take me back to California. Take me back home. The resort had been her idea in the first place. Joshua had wanted nothing to do with it. When she first told him about her dream project, soon after they started dating, he'd taken it as a good change of tracks, nothing more. At the time, he'd been drifting, taking odd carpentry jobs, living in crowded, seedy apartments. The desert was wide open, she had said, filled with possibilities. He should have told her the truth, but he'd wanted to hurt her then. After the loans had fallen through, after her precious hotel had shrunk to a cheesy paperweight. A baby, Joshua had answered, knowing full well that she couldn't give it to him. I think we should have a child. Right then, she decided to have the surgery, to clear a path through her fallopian tubes. Oh, God, Joshua whispered at the pool. He remembered her dreamy smile, the way she'd squeezed his hand, her playful pat as the orderly pushed away her gurney. It was clear to him now, for the first time, the wave he'd set in motion. Suddenly Joshua found himself behind the registration desk, with no memory of walking away from the pool. The neon sign lit the room red and green. Joshua smiled. He'd never felt such a clear sense of purpose. Gingerly, he reached under the counter and grabbed his shotgun. And then he was outside. Joshua sat cross-legged upon a flat rock, cradled the gun in his arms. The wind had died down. The sky was overcast and starless. In the distance, the pool shone beautifully, like a glass eye on the dirt. He imagined the ripples spreading through the sand, dragging him all the way out here, to the edge of everything. He thought it strange, before pulling the trigger, how sweet the barrel tasted in his mouth. What well, we got ourselves here, Sheriff Wilder said, holding fast to his belt buckle is a clear-cut case of self-inflicted murder. He took off his sunglasses and wiped the sweat off his forehead, using his shirt tail like a schoolboy. Standing by a poolside table, Maria got a quick glimpse of his belly, which was pale, round, and hairless. She turned her head away. For the first time in years, she didn't feel like talking. Maria was still dressed in her one-piece bathing suit. A dry towel hung from her shoulders. That morning, she'd come down to the courtyard for her swim and noticed the spotlights underwater. Joshua had always been very careful to shut everything off before going to bed. Maria's first guess was that he'd left in a hurry, maybe some kind of emergency. Then she saw the crowded sky, 
and the buzzards dotting the rocky hills, fighting for scraps. She called the police, even though Carlos had said it was a terrible idea. On the phone, Sheriff Wilder sounded like a much larger man. His voice had a soft quality that Maria associated with bullies and thugs. As it turned out, he was only one or two inches taller than Laurita. Whatever authority he carried had been starched into his uniform. Suicide, he continued. I just wanted to say that, so you don't think you're under suspicion. We all knew that Joshua had his problems. Carlos sat on one of the patio chairs, maybe a bit too relaxed. His legs were spread apart, his arms dangled between his knees. He wore an embroidered Gallabara shirt and jeans. Is that right? He said sarcastically. Oh, yeah, the sheriff said. I mean, living alone out here with no business had to be suicide. He seemed overly proud of the word, as if he just read it in a textbook. Which, I have to say, is something I never understood myself. I mean, back in Nam, I spent three years in a POW camp, with the beatings and the rotted food and all that. And not even once did I think of offing myself. Life doesn't get much worse than that, let me tell you. You had hope, Carlos said. You knew that you'd be getting out of there someday. I suppose, he said tentatively. Carlos leaned forward in the chair and glared at the sheriff. Just imagine if you'd known the opposite, that all that was left of your life was a hole the size of a doghouse, that every week you'd have your toenails stripped or your teeth filed or your eyelids punctured with needles. Imagine knowing that nothing would ever change. Life wouldn't seem quite so dear anymore, would it? Carlos, please, Maria said. She had never heard him talk like that before. Sheriff Wilder tried to smile, but all he could manage was a toothy sneer. Well, I think I should be heading back to the station. There's a bunch of paperwork still to be filled out. What should we do? Maria said. I mean, about staying here. Don't see why you and your daughter can't stay at the motel until we figure out the next of kin situation. Besides, we may want to ask you a few questions, you know, about Mr. Quizwell's state of mind and all that. Seems that Mr. Gutierrez here is an expert on the subject. Carlos tipped his head and grinned. Just an informed observer, he said. That's all. I just wanted to say, Sheriff Wilder added, that I'm really sorry, ma'am, about your husband beating you. That's not right. That shouldn't happen. If it was under my jurisdiction, I'd have dumped his ass in jail. It took her a second to realize what the man was talking about. Peter abusing her had been Joshua's cover story as to why she and Laurita had run away. Maria had simply performed it. I appreciate that, she said, and smiled softly like a victim. After Sheriff Wilder drove off, Larita walked into the courtyard and plopped down on a chair next to her uncle. Her hands were pruned from doing the breakfast dishes. Maria was silently amazed. Back home, her daughter had seldom handled a dirty plate. How are you doing, mija? Tio Carlos asked Larita. You holding up all right? I'm fine, Larita said brushing her lips with the back of her hand. Maria paced under the shade of a poolside umbrella, scenarios tumbling in her head. After a minute, she opened her eyes wide and said, We have to get out of here. And go where? Carlos shot back. I have no idea, but if our names get into a police computer, it's only a matter of time before Peter finds us. We might as well take our chances in Las Vegas. Carlos laughed. These cops don't have computers. I doubt that they even have calculators. Maria took a shallow breath. This here, she said loudly, this is about my daughter. Yeah, it's about me, Laurita exploded. It's always about me. She stood up and ran back into the building, marking her path with a luminescent trail. After Laurita ran off and Carlos promised to talk to her, Maria decided to take a swim. That had always made her feel better when she was a child. Perhaps it would work again. On her twelfth lap, Maria saw, through the churned water in her wake, a piece of cloth lying at the bottom of the pool. Thinking that it could have been Joshua's, and in some way it connected to his suicide, she stopped her crawl and tipped downward like a swing. Underwater, she couldn't make out the color of the cloth, nor the design which was hopelessly distorted by the refracted light. 
Still, there was something familiar about the fabric. It slipped and crinkled between her fingers. She brought it close to her eyes, unfolded a pair of straps and a skirt. A dress. Her dress. The dress. Maria swung her arms like a fan and slowly rose to the surface. It was impossible. The sundress had been lost under the Caribbean waves. She had left it behind when she swam after the skiff. It couldn't be here. She couldn't be holding it in her hands. She felt her blood streaming through her temples. Cicadas chirped in the distance. The air smelled of loam and pine needles. Que diablos, she mumbled. To her left, there was a wall of trees, pines, their bark gray and cragged. To her right stood an elegant two-story house, with sliding glass doors surrounded by a wildflower garden. It was early afternoon, but the wind on her ears felt cool and moist. Cloth in hand, Maria climbed out of the pool, which had suddenly become smaller, almost square in shape. The springboard was gone, so were the cocktail tables. As she staggered toward the house, Maria began to experience an odd sense of déjà vu, a hint of unacquired knowledge, of memories without experience. She knew that this was her house, though it looked nothing like their modest colonial in Long Island. She knew that the water that streamed down her legs had come from her pool, though they had never been able to afford one. The trees, the ceramic-tiled patio, the garden, they all belonged to her. She opened a sliding glass door. Behind it, there was a lavish parlor, marble floors, black leather furniture, 20-foot ceiling. Peter stood by the empty fireplace, dressed in slacks and a white shirt, holding a wine glass with three relaxed fingers. Maria was not surprised by this. When she walked inside, he turned quickly and smiled at her. Better change, he said. Christine and David should be here in about 15 minutes. Don't worry, she found herself saying. You know they're always late. Is that what you're wearing? Peter pointed at the wet dress in Maria's hand. Oh, no, she said, suddenly confused. I found this, well, it was in the pool. Maybe one of the Kaufman kids dropped it by accident. Maria shook her head violently, as if to drain her ear canal. Something was screaming in her skull. This wasn't her house. This wasn't her life. Where's Lorita? She said, as calmly as possible. Pardon me? Where's my daughter? She yelled. Peter carefully placed his wine glass on the mantelpiece. You know where she is, he said, looking down at his feet. She did. They had turned her into the authorities. Peter had gotten another promotion at the bank. She had opened her own real estate agency. They had bought a new house, built a pool, gotten in shape. No, she said. The parking lot was empty, except for the still dead Corolla and Carlos's brand new Chevy. Mr. Criswell's pickup truck was parked out back, away from visitors. As she walked to her uncle's car, Laurita felt the gravel rolling under her sneakers. The hot wind filled her t-shirt, made the wide sleeves flutter. She cupped her hands against the driver's side window, vaguely hoping to find the key in the ignition. No such luck. Instead, she saw a couple of salsa cassettes strewn on the dashboard, their plastic cases warped by the sun. She sat on the hood of the Chevy, waiting. After a minute, Tio Carlos pushed through the front door, stepped onto the gravel, jogged toward her. His gallabera was drenched with sweat. Through the fabric, Larita could see the black hairs on his chest, matted into a neat triangle. She was glad that it was Carlos who'd come for her, and not her mother. He stopped in front of Laurita and caught his breath. He hadn't gotten used to the dry heat, apparently. It's like the beach out here, he said. All you need is the brackish smell in the coastline, maybe a couple of palm trees. He paused to scratch his mustache. Your mother is trying, you know. She's trying real hard. I didn't ask her, Laurita said. Maybe, but she did ask me to talk to you he said. Maybe I don't want to talk. Okay, he said. That's fine with me. He shuffled around the car and started pacing back to the office. The wind made a breathy sound in Laurita's ear, like a child whistling. 
Wait a minute, she called out. Yeah? Did she say anything about me? Your mother? Only that you're being a brat, that she's getting sick of your histrionics. Does she hate me? The question had jumped from her mouth before she was able to stop it. Carlos laughed much too quickly. What? Of course not. Why would she hate you? For messing things up for her? For breaking up the family? A string of light fluttered above Larita's shoulders. She did her best to ignore it. Well, Carlos began, then stopped. Well, what? What did she say about me? She didn't tell me much, but what you're saying kind of makes sense. Maybe she does blame you for being stuck out here. The sparks grew brighter, coiled into a rope-like weave. I know she blames me, she said, trying to squelch her fear. I mean, it's my fault, so of course she blames me. What I want to know is if she hates me. I can't tell you that, Carlos said and held up his hands. Hate is something that happens between two people. You can't really see it from the outside. Oh, come on, Larita said, exasperated. There was no way Tio Carlos could be serious. It's the truth. Look, when your grandfather was very sick, right before he died, he asked me not to let Maria come to his funeral. Can you believe that? He blamed her for killing Mammy during the delivery. Right at the end, he said to me, I fulfilled my responsibilities as a father. Now I want to die in peace. Nobody knew. I wouldn't have known myself if he hadn't whispered it in my ear that... The sound of a screaming engine covered the end of his speech. Larita glanced at the road. The yellow Corvette was already a mile down the highway, raising a great dust cloud into the air. Shading her eyes, she watched the car shrink to a gleaming dot. When she turned back to the motel... Tio Carlos was gone. The front door shut by itself, without sound. For a while afterward, as she tiptoed upstairs to her bedroom, as she quietly filled her backpack with tube socks and underwear, the highway remained in her pupils, a ghostly artificial coastline, a path through the light. The dress hit the kitchen counter with a sick slapping sound, like meat on the cutting block. Maria's trip had certainly been no hallucination. The wet rag proved it. She was now back in Joshua Criswell's motel, back in the desert. But the dress lingered, coiled into a red and purple mess, stained with sea salt. She had returned. Maria gave herself credit for that. As soon as she realized where she was, she had dashed out of the living room and jumped into the square pool. She hit her head on the bottom, a glancing blow that left her momentarily disoriented as if she'd been caught in a rolling wave. When she surfaced, the beautiful house had been replaced by the sun-washed motel. The pines had withered to spindly, dry bushes. The rich soil had turned to sand. Maria waded to the edge and lifted herself from the water, the cloth wrapped tightly around her arm. As she walked to the kitchen, she felt at once confused, relieved, and disappointed, as if she'd been awakened from a strange but pleasant dream. Her forehead throbbed. There would be a lump by morning. In the cupboard, Maria found a bottle of rice wine, which Joshua kept, used to keep, for Japanese recipes. She unscrewed the cap, served three inches into an empty mason jar, then swallowed the pungent liquid in one quick gulp. She hated to drink. She hated sake in particular. Still, she needed something hot in her stomach. A cold void had opened inside of her. Just a moment ago, she had conceived the inconceivable, and she loathed herself for it. I have to talk to her, she thought. Yes, I need to explain myself. She remembered the painful delivery, the feeling of absolution when she'd realized that she was still alive, that unlike her mother, she had survived the endeavor. She remembered the weight of Laurita in her arms, surprisingly light at first, but soon a burden straining her back and elbows, crushing her breast. Maria dropped the mason jar in the sink and sauntered through the common room, up the carpeted stairs, down the hallway. She stopped at her daughter's door, knocked three times, as if giving a signal. Laurita, she said. Are you sleeping, Mija? There was no answer. Warily, she grasped the brass knob. The metal was cold in her hand. 
The words came as soon as she opened the door. Hello, sister. Carlos was lying sideways on the bed, his head nestled in the crook of his arm, pretending to be asleep. He smiled icily at her and stretched like a cat. Maria stood motionless. There was something wildly wrong about the scene before her. Sunlight came too brightly through the shuttered windows. The air stank of rotten teeth. What are you doing here? She said. I thought you were talking to Laurita. Laurita's gone, Carlos said. His voice sounded different, deeper, and possibly resonant. Gone? What do you mean? She left. She packed her things and headed for the road. And you let her? Maria could feel her throat tightening, her heart beating without rhythm. Sure, Carlos said. He sat up in bed and rubbed his eyes. That's what you wanted, right? Get her out of your life. Maria stepped back into the hallway. The door shined with a dark, oily gleam. You're not my brother, she said in Spanish. Of course I'm not your brother, he said in the same language and licked his teeth. That would be foolish. Carlos Gutierrez has been dead for a week. Slit his wrists with a bread knife. I'm afraid he made a terrible mess of the kitchen. He rose from bed slowly, pulled his shoulders back and groaned. Suddenly, a crack opened in his sternum. Maria watched in painful fascination. His body folded outward, then reversed itself like a glove. Inside, there was a shapeless clot, which soon gathered into a creature. A swollen parody of a man, clothed in tattered shadows, its head sculpted from a slab of bone. Towering before her, the thing peered at Maria with dead, igneous eyes. She imagined herself screaming, shielding her face, cowering. She couldn't move. Her muscles felt like paper. Her throat was filled with glass shards. La muerte, she thought. The creature appeared to smile, though his jaw was fixed in place. No, not death, he said. Something else entirely. I am the bearer of ill tidings, the flawless, cruel mirror. I am fear, the shatterer of illusions, the weaver of guilt and failure. I am, in a word, despair. The dusty Plymouth Reliant was heading westward. Standing at the edge of the pavement, Laurita raised her thumb impassively. Hip thrust to the side, elbow touching her flank. Since she'd left the motel about twenty minutes ago, two cars had gone by her without even tapping their brakes. Now she was hot and parched, the strap of her backpack cut into her shoulder, and she could feel a nasty blister swelling on her heel. Chances were that she would be walking till nightfall, and she was none too happy about it. To her surprise, the Reliance stopped a few yards ahead of Laurita. Oklahoma plates, she noticed as she hurried to the car. Must have been traveling for days. The driver, a slim blonde man, dressed in crisp jeans and a white Oxford shirt, gave her a quick once-over, then reached across the seats and opened the door. Larita climbed in at once, ignoring the paper bags that covered the floor, the stench of dried beer, the french fries in the ashtray. She was jittery as a bird, but the man looked harmless enough. Besides, it was far too hot to walk. As soon as they pulled away from the shoulder, the driver introduced himself as Paul Bovary, luckiest man on the planet. Ah, Larita said. Without thinking, she drew her knees together and crossed her ankles. You headed for Vegas? The man said. She nodded. Is that where you're going? Oh, yeah, he said with a slippery laugh. We're cleaning that sucker out, me and Jesus. You just wait and see. Right, she said, the sun filling her eyes. From her backpack, she produced a granola bar, a chunky Walkman, a pair of sunglasses. This is going to be a very long ride, she thought. As the driver launched into his sparkling tail, a disembodied voice had told him to gamble everything at the roulette table. Laurita turned around in the seat and stared through the rear windshield. Half a mile back, the Vicky Motel sign was plunging into the desert. 
She opened her mouth and closed it. Suddenly she longed for the fake almond scent of her mother's Corolla, for the sleekness of the vinyl upholstery. She winced and curled her face, as if she'd just bitten into a lime. The facts were clear. This time, Maria would not follow. Laurita was leaving for good. Fear beaded like sweat on her skin. Her mouth tasted of fear. With every breath, she drew a lungful of it. Maria heard fear in the clattering air conditioner and the sparse roar of the highway. Her knuckles were afraid. Her eyes were afraid. Her spine felt like a guitar string, pulled unbearably tight, vibrating. What do you want from me? She gasped. Sustenance, Despair said simply. There's food in the kitchen. Despair laughed, a terrible grating screech. I feed on souls, Maria, on human pain and hopelessness. Why us? Maria said. We've nothing but... No, no, the demon interrupted. You are nothing. Your daughter is everything. Maria started to talk, but despair cut her off with a wave of his bleached hand. It was so beautiful, that first display, he said, glancing wistfully at the stucco ceiling. So pure and meaningless. Thirty horrified children, their hearts crying in unison, their teacher running out of the classroom, out of the building, throwing herself into traffic. Such a beautiful, chaotic instant. The incident in the school lab. Through the haze of fright, Maria recalled the principal's story. One of Laurita's classmates had, as a joke, replaced her fetal pig with a rat. When she lifted the tray cover, all hell had broken loose. Laurita would be my conduit, despair continued. Through her I shall project my despondency across cities. I shall drain the souls of nations, and my power will be unmeasurable. At once Maria felt a brilliant swell of anger. I won't let you, she whispered. Despair spread his shadow cloak and turned away. Please, Maria, spare me the protective mother performance. We both know it is a lie. I love my daughter, she cried, warmth rushing into her limbs. You have to be alive for that, he said and shook his head. You have to be alive. Despair stood by the window, apparently deep in thought, facing away from her. Laurita's bed lay between them its linen stripped and tossed over the side. Maria bent her elbows, flexed her knees slightly. This was her opportunity. The fall from the second floor would not kill him, but it would certainly hurt him. She crouched silently, feeling a burn in her thighs and back, the sweet ache of anticipation. The carpet was soft on her palms. She thought of her daughter, of glass shattering, of blood and crushed bones, and she pounced stepping onto the mattress and springing forward, eyes shut, forearms crossed over her face. Vete a carajo! She screamed before hitting the water. Blackness, then a washed moonlight, plankton glittering like sequins. Maria floated in brine, suddenly awake. The skirt of her sundress fluttered about her, as if she were dancing, spinning to a delicious mambo tune. There was no music, though, no smell of coconut milk, no children in blue cotton uniforms giggling. Only the sea, salt in her wide open eyes, a sharp pain in her throat. She had just fallen off the skiff, that much she remembered. The rudder had smacked her young chest and sent her over the stern. I was asleep. The wind changed direction, and the rudder swiveled and the cold beam pushed her backwards. I was asleep. The wood creaked and the rudder swiveled. How could I know what happened that night? There was a creak, a step, the skiff rocked slightly, and she felt a sudden heat and a heavy hand on her shoulder, and she opened her eyes, and she saw the arm, the small dent of his elbow, the black hairs on his wrist. Underwater, she smoothed the front of her dress, slapped down the skirt. Father had pushed her. It was unbelievable. And yet it made sense to her.
just like the taste of yucca made sense, or the blue of the sky, or the flutter of pigeons in the morning. Augusto had given her a good shove, and she'd lost her balance and flipped over the stern, hands grasping air, eyes numbed. He'd killed her that night, inside, where it counted. Hair rising like seaweed, Maria tipped backwards and opened her mouth. The water was cool and sharp on her gums. She felt like a mock-up, a hollow figure made of wicker, cloth, and skin, playing the part of a human being. Her lungs were starving, her heart beat to a syncopated rhythm. All she had to do was breathe. The sea would take care of the rest. Above her, there was a mess of ripples and swirls, shifting with the current. Moonlight brightened the swells, made them shimmer as they rolled past her. Heading for England, she guessed, or wherever the Gulf Stream would take them. Or maybe they would dissipate, or mingle with other swells, or crash onto a Bahamian shore. My wake, she thought abruptly, when I fell into the sea. She remembered Joshua Criswell, poor Joshua Criswell, lying on his poolside chair, watching the ripples. When she'd asked him about them, he told her that they had changed. She hadn't understood what he meant back then, but now, all of a sudden, it seemed like such a simple, crucial truth. Maria was drowning. She pushed against the concrete floor and shot through the chlorinated water. Inches from the surface, she felt a yank on her left leg, as though someone were holding to her ankle. She glanced over her bare shoulder and immediately saw the knot, the thick strand of rope, the cast-iron table lying at the bottom of the pool. Desperate for air, she thrashed wildly, kicked left and right, stretched her foot until the bones cracked. She reached upward and felt a dry afternoon breeze on her palm. Her stomach shriveled. She pulled herself up at a leg and tried untangling the rope, but the knot was good and tight, the kind Augusto had taught her when she was a girl. She stopped and collected herself. I am dying, she thought, without bitterness. She touched her shin, ran a finger up her thigh. Right now, though, right this moment, I'm alive. She felt calm and lightheaded. She stretched her arms and waved them in wide circles, hoping that someone would see her. No, not hoping. Hope was as bad as despair. She had to live the present, not the future. Maria drew into a fetal position. In her mind, every second became a new, separate frame. Air bubbles appeared and disappeared. Sand blinked across the pool's floor. Four feet away, the water split, churned. Through the foam, Maria saw a girl floating in the pool, her eyes panicked, covered in blue and white sparks. Then there was a girl swimming towards her, and a girl cutting the rope with a kitchen knife, dragging Maria upward, tugging her brusquely over the edge. Mommy! Laudi just screamed. Shocked out of her stupor, Maria bent forward and coughed into her fist spitting a dribble of brine. Then she breathed, and it was as if the world had emptied into her body. What happened here? Laudi said after a moment. Your uncle, Maria gasped. But it wasn't your uncle. Tio Carlos, he did this? Maria nodded, then shook her head and coughed again. There was far too much to explain. Gingerly, she reached forward and held her daughter. I was so afraid, Mia, she said. I thought I'd lost you. I thought you were gone. I changed my mind, Laudita said, a line she'd been saving since Paul Bovary had dropped her off by the side of the road. Felt good to finally use it. I love you, Maria said. Laudita pulled away as if she'd burned herself on her mother's skin. What do you mean when you say that? I mean that I love you, Maria said. She was at once frightened and annoyed. I hear you saying it, but I can't feel it. No lo siento en el corazón. Maria almost lost her temper. Her hand shook, her ankle throbbed painfully. Just a moment ago, she'd very nearly died, and the girl still questioned her heart. Then Maria saw the blankness in her face, and she realized that Larita was serious, that she really couldn't tell what her mother felt. Since when? Maria said. For a couple of years, since I started junior high, I guess, it got worse after the thing in the lab. It isn't just with me, 
Maria said. She had meant it as a question. The girl said nothing. She stared at her mother and swept a lock of wet hair from her forehead. Maria took the gesture as an invitation. Hesitating, she ran her fingers on Laudita's cheek. She had plum skin, tacky and smooth. Laudita shrank back, avoiding her touch. Maria quickly took her nape and drew her to her breast. Ay, negra, she said. A cold, acid wind stung her nostrils. While Maria watched, the motel twisted into a narrow, spiraled tower. The evening sun fell away in strips, and the brush turned into a purple steppe. The sky looked bruised. A few yards away, in the spot where Joshua had tended his cactus garden, despair slowly broke through the dirt, kept rising until his feet left the ground. He hung lazily over the withered, upturned plants, head tipped as if on a noose. His shadow cloak flitted in the breeze, reminding her of the tattered sail of the dress. Not this time, Maria thought. The demon laughed. How poignant, he said, batting the dust from his muscular thighs. How perfectly poignant. Larita tried to turn and look, but Maria held her firmly. Listen to me, she whispered. This is my love, Mija. This right now, what I'm doing. The girl shut her eyes. To believe her mother, she realized she would have to make up the word, give it a new meaning. Heat of a body, smell of wet hair and spandex. It almost made sense to her. You're now part of my realm, Despair shouted, obviously amused. Fixtures, so to speak. He hovered closer, pretending to walk on air. With a flick of his wrist, the ground rose about mother and daughter, covered their legs and waists in soot. This is my love, Maria said again, her voice trembling. Yes, Laudita thought. Instantly, a ripple of light, like soap film, issued from her skin. As it expanded, the wake scoured despair's illusion, purple sand lifting, wilted cacti tossing in the wind. Then it slapped the demon, and he grimaced and tumbled backwards, cursing in a loud, unintelligible hiss. The impact pushed him clear through the spiraled tower, which split in half and crumbled. Before disappearing into the brightness, the demon yelled, No hope without despair. To their surprise, Sheriff Wilder didn't ask many questions about Carlos's disappearance. Maria had only to say the word mutant, and he nodded and stroked his cheek. A few years ago we had one in Rayleigh, he said. A town kid, liked to burn things with his fingers. Heard a bunch of people, it seems, though nobody pressed charges. We ended up having to call those X-Factor guys from TV. They came right up and took him away. Don't know what we do nowadays, since X-Factor don't do that stuff no more. Something like that happened with Tio Carlos, Larita said, trying to hide an embarrassed grin. She leaned forward on the vinyl couch and crossed her arms. He was a shape-changer, Maria said. She sat on the reception desk, next to the empty cash register, her swollen foot resting on a stool. Pretending to be my brother. I guess Peter hired him to convince me to go back home. Let me tell you, as soon as we found out, we grabbed Joshua's shotgun and sent him away. You did the right thing, Sheriff Wilder said. He fixed his gun belt and stepped sideways to the glass door. Just as he was about to open it, he added, Ma'am, I'm sorry about you having to vacate the place. Stupid bank rules. I know, Maria said. But I was thinking, since you're going to be taking the bus, maybe I can buy that Corolla of yours. I mean, the engine's busted, but I bet the parts would sell. How much would you want for it? Maria turned to Laurita and hunched her eyebrows. I don't know, she said. A hundred bucks? Five hundred? Sheriff Wilder pulled out a money clip and methodically counted the bills. Sounds like a bargain. She thanked him with a broad smile. After he'd gone outside, Maria dropped to the floor, carefully landing on her left foot, and said quietly, It made him feel good, helping us out. We didn't feel like a big man. Oh, Laudita said, touching her jaw. 
Later that morning, as they loaded the bags into Carlos's abandoned Chevy, Laurita asked her mother about the night on the boat. Maria had told her everything about despair's illusion, and now Laurita wanted to know if it was true, if Augusto had pushed his daughter overboard. I was sleeping, Maria said sheepishly. I didn't see a thing. She shut the trunk and hobbled around the car to the driver's seat. Laurita climbed on the passenger side. The car was steaming inside. Even after two days, the upholstery still smelled of menthol cigarettes. It was then that it hit her. Theo Carlos had killed himself. Suddenly she started to bawl, so hard that her face hurt. For her uncle, for Joshua Criswell, for the father she'd left behind. Light danced on her body, spread over the dashboard, through the cushioned seats. Holding the key to the ignition, Maria felt a twitch in her chest, and she folded over the steering wheel and cried. It didn't matter that it was her daughter's grief. It didn't matter at all. Carnage Mayhem Party by Robert Sheckley There was a big crowd that day at the Vanetti Palace on the Giudecca in Venice. The Jewel of the Adriatic was hosting that year's Conference of International Forensic Psychologists. This was the second day of the conference, and all seats in the hall, which had been converted from a 14th century Venetian palazzo, were taken. The aisles were filled with standees, and some people were even crouched in the stairwells, trying to avoid the disapproving eyes of the ushers. This much interest was unusual for a scholarly event. The papers read at this conference were usually on the dull side, even though they did have to do with crime and psychology. Today's paper, however, had been long awaited. It promised, for the first time, the inside story of what happened when Professor Charles Morrison of Harvard and MIT attempted his revolutionary new experiment in reforming the criminally insane. Reformation schemes had been tried before, of course, with little success. What was unique about this one was the fact that it involved Cletus Cassidy, the supervillain known as Carnage. There had been rumors and controversies surrounding Morrison's famous experiment. It had been carried out little more than a year ago in the California town of Santa Rosa. The results of that experiment had been hotly disputed, and even now the facts were not fully known. Now it was expected that Edward Ramakrishna, the man who had been Morrison's assistant at the time of the fateful experiment, was going to reveal what really happened in his presentation. There was an undercurrent of whispered conversation as the master of ceremonies made the usual announcements. But everyone became quiet when he presented Dr. Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna was a small, dark-haired, dark-skinned man. He was slight in build, and although young, he already had a professorial stoop. In front of the audience, he appeared at first diffident and unsure of himself. But he soon gained assurance, and his soft voice, amplified by the public address system, took on the aspects of a hypnotic chant. The audience listened in fascination as Ramakrishna brought them back to those days when Charles Morrison was setting up his experiment. Those fools! Those utter fools! Morrison said as he burst into the office he shared with Ramakrishna. They're so besotted with their behaviorism, they can't even consider the possibility of a proper Freudian experiment. Morrison, like his assistant, was a short man, but unlike him, was barrel-chested and balding. He had sharp blue eyes that glinted behind his spectacles. His big white face showed anger close to frenzy as he slapped a pile of papers down on the desk. They are laughing at my theory, Morrison said. Ramakrishna knew that Morrison was referring to his hypothesis concerning one of Sigmund Freud's most basic theories, that which divided the human psyche into ego, superego, and id. Morrison believed, as had Freud before him, that there was a biological basis to the psychic components. It was Morrison's contention that these basic divisions of the human mind were the outcome of patterning laid down in the very DNA of human beings, and that this division was more susceptible to physical documentation than even Carl Jung's celebrated hypothesis of the archetypal memory. The question had always been, 
Where could these psychic functions be located? There was no evidence for them in scientific literature, but in recent years, amazing developments have been made in brain topology using new neuron mapping techniques based on the work of Reed Richards and Tony Stark, though these techniques had not been fully accepted by the scientific community. Using this, Morrison had discovered the long-predicted threefold division of the human psyche. Of greater practical importance, he had found specific agents to which these psychic subdivisions reacted. They were part of a class he called psychic enhancers. He had been able to separate out specific serums that corresponded to the pure functions of the psychic entities and to produce pure essences of these compounds, serums which acted as instigators and amplifiers of id, ego, and superego. His study had been published in the authoritative British journal Science, and Morrison had just received the first batch of comments, some of which had come to his home by post, others to his email address. He had glanced over the letters and printouts of the email on his way to the office, and he was furious. Look at these things, he said, waving a handful of papers at Ramakrishna. These fools haven't even taken the time to think over and digest my thesis. They haven't worked over my mathematical proofs or even read the necessary literature on the subject. Instead, out of their own fixed and dogmatic views, they rush to condemn me, calling my work quackery, pseudoscience, and even outright fraud. This is indeed unfortunate, Ramakrishna said. He was a graduate of West Bengal University and had done his advanced work at Oxford. His quiet contrasted with Morrison's bluster. Ramakrishna felt that his equanimity made him the ideal assistant to the impulsive Morrison. However, even he felt some of the outrage that Morrison was expressing, for he too had been involved in the research and experiments, and Morrison had permitted him to sign his name to the article. I'd be happy to help you answer the letters, Ramakrishna said. Surely when we point out the errors in their judgments, the defects in their methodology... We'll do no such thing, Morrison said. We're going to prove my thesis in the only way that'll make any impact on these dunces. We're going to take a violent supercriminal and convert him to an exemplary meekness. Ramakrishna blinked. The theory hasn't been tested in the field yet. No time like the present, Morrison said. I suppose so, Ramakrishna said. But why not start with some ordinary psychotic? Morrison had been sitting at his desk, brooding on the pile of critical letters. Now he looked up, glaring. And have those fools say I picked an easy one? Not a chance. I'm going to pick the hardest there is. The most impossible one. Curing him will prove my case beyond doubt. Who did you have in mind? Ramakrishna asked. Ever hear of carnage? Morrison asked. Ramakrishna had indeed heard of carnage. Who hadn't? Already a notorious serial killer, Cletus Cassidy had had a fateful encounter with an alien being while in prison. He'd merged with this alien, which provided him with a lethal, shape-changing costume. When he wore the costume, he called himself Carnage, and Carnage was a worse serial killer than Cassidy had ever been. Others had tried to cure him. Lifestream Technologies had attempted a physical removal of the alien presence from Cassidy's blood. The Ravencroft Institute had gone for a psychological cure. Both failed miserably. Still, Ramakrishna decided, if Morrison's theory worked on Carnage, it would work on anyone. Dr. Morrison's superior was Captain Flynn Baxter, who worked out of the National Police Advisory Board in Washington, D.C. Baxter had had an exemplary career both as a criminologist and as a working cop. He had been in charge of police efforts in two of America's most notorious crime cities, Detroit and East St. Louis. When he retired from active duty on the streets, the president had appointed him to head up the newly formed National Police Advisory Board. Baxter had always been a strong proponent of Dr. Morrison's views on the possible re-education of criminals, but this scheme almost took his breath away by its very boldness. Do you want to reform a supervillain? he said. Did you have a particular one in mind? Morrison nodded. Cletus Cassidy. Carnage? That's a big order, Charlie, Baxter said. Couldn't you pick someone a little simpler to start with? That's what my assistant asked me, Morrison said. 
and I'll give you the same answer I gave him. This theory can and will work, and we need something spectacular to shut up the critics. Something that'll get enough headlines so that we can get proper funding for a really effective program. We don't even have carnage in custody, Baxter said. Do you think he's just going to walk in because you send out a notice saying you want to reform him? I think I can get him, Morrison said. How? My idea is built around an item I saw in the newspaper a few days ago. It seems that a group of the country's most dangerous killers are being taken from prisons all around the country and brought to a special think tank in Santa Rosa, California. They're going to be studied by experts in the hopes of preventing further crimes. I've heard about that plan, too, Baxter said. What's that got to do with Cassidy? Nothing yet, but it will when I put my plan into operation. Charlie, nobody even knows where Cassidy lives, where he hangs out. He's got no known M.O., except that he hates Spider-Man. How do you expect to get word to him? Leave that to me, sir. Do I have your approval? I've backed you before, Captain Baxter said. And I'll back you again if you insist, but think about it, Charlie. This can be a very dangerous scheme. Then I have your okay? Morrison asked once again. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Thank you, sir. You'll be the first to hear of the results. Ramakrishna was more than a little apprehensive when he heard from Morrison that the scheme to reform Carnage had been approved. The idea lay in getting hold of Carnage long enough to give him a dose of one of the purified essences that Morrison had succeeded in isolating. This substance was too powerful for an ordinary man to take. It would likely kill him. But Morrison had obtained Carnage's biological profile from Ravencroft, and his unique alien metabolism would allow him to survive. When Carnage swallowed the superego substance that was the basis of conscience, Carnage would become a changed man, reformed from within, incapable of continuing in his horrifying ways. That at least was the theory. But still... It was a risky experiment. It was difficult to the point of impossibility to get anywhere near Carnage. But it seemed worth taking that risk because the supervillain's campaign of terror was so gruesome that it seemed reasonable to try anything to stop him. Over the next several days, the social experiment that was to be carried out at Santa Rosa, California, received more publicity than the founders of the experiment had ever expected. Due to Baxter's ties with the media, the experiment got sound bites on all the major TV news broadcasts. There were follow-up articles on it in the newspapers. Suddenly, it had gone from an obscure experiment to the biggest move against crime of the century. Morrison was gambling that Cletus Cassidy, wherever he was, would hear about this and would be intrigued. That part of the scientist's theory was proven correct. Cassidy, presently holed up in a suburb of Dallas, heard about the experiment, and he was indeed intrigued. The mind of a creature like Carnage had unpredictability as its keynote. His thoughts were chaotic, a wild mingling of memories of the past and visions of the future. But even a mind like this, spinning out of control much of the time, had its affinities. It was drawn to crime. In the part of that mind that was still like a little boy, it desired a bold endeavor. It also loved to show itself in all its horrifying, mutated splendor. The TV newscasts that Cassidy watched contained ghastly descriptions of the deeds of various of these serial killers. How one was a multiple killer specializing in the old and helpless, another was a stalker, a third specialized in torturing family pets. One was worse than the other. Carnage's conclusion? Sounds like these are people I'd like to party with. After a recent incident when he learned he could transmit himself across cyberspace, Cassidy had come to appreciate the use of computers. The people who used to own this apartment, and whose bodies were starting to stink up the bathroom, had a top-of-the-line computer, and he used it to call up some information on the town of Santa Rosa. The place was in central California. It had about 20,000 inhabitants and was over 100 miles from the nearest big city. It was noted for its peaceful lifestyle. Not for long, Carnage decided. He studied the plans of the facility, which were set out in full in the newspaper accounts. He saw that the point of least security would occur just after the killers arrived at the Institute. 
the escorting guards, armor-clad guardsmen on loan from the vault, would leave, and the guards at the Institute, a much smaller force, would take over. That's definitely the time to drop in, Carnage thought. He could feel the excitement rising in him. He morphed into the red and black skin of his alien persona and got ready. The serial killers were flown in from various parts of the country. They were kept under guard in a high-security room in the airport until the last of them had been accounted for. Then, under the watchful eyes of the guardsmen, they were put into a bus for the final 112-mile ride to the Institute. There were 67 of them, some in their early 20s, others already in old age. Before they were allowed on this trip, each had had a thorough physical and mental examination and had been put under deep narcosynthetic hypnosis for further tests. The bus arrived at the Santa Rosa facility. It was a series of low white buildings surrounded by a high electrified fence. When the bus pulled up in front of the main building, it was met by a new group of guards hired by the facility. These guards, armed with high-tech weaponry provided by S.H.I.E.L.D., escorted the killers inside. From a clump of trees nearby, Carnage was watching all this. His unearthly red and black skin pulsated with excitement. He was in a high good humor, really pleased by the prospect of a good mayhem party among like-minded people. The electrified fence barely tickled his altered form. Now he was just waiting for the right moment to make his appearance. Inside the Institute, Ramakrishna asked Morrison, What if Carnage doesn't show? Then we try something else, Morrison said. We'll have wasted the money publicizing this thing, but that's minor. The trouble is going to come if he does show. The trouble and the success. Let us pray that it works, Ramakrishna said. The killers were led through the hallways in the main building into the auditorium, under the watchful eyes of their guards. Morrison then came out on the stage at the front of the auditorium, welcoming his guests. We'll be getting to the experiments in about an hour, he said. Meanwhile, all of you are to stay here. And when the experiments do begin, we ask that you not touch anything in the labs. Stored there are psychochemicals that could cause uncertain and unpredictable results. Morrison then left the stage. Back up the killer's attention. The words spread among them like wildfire. They've got the really good stuff stored in the lab. Man, if we could just get our hands on that. The problem was the guards. Not as dangerous as the guardsmen, but given that the guards had ray guns and the killers were unarmed and handcuffed, there was little chance of them even leaving the auditorium. There was one among them who wasn't taking part in this whispered speculation. He was a young man with red hair, and he had a withdrawn, almost sleepy look. Finally, he turned to the guys who had been talking and said, You guys really want to get into that good stuff? They looked at him. Nobody recognized him. Surely this guy hadn't been on the bus, or had he? Who are you? One of them asked. Well, you wouldn't know me like this, the stranger said. But when I change a little bit into my work skin, maybe you'll know who I am. His clothes and handcuffs rippled and began to change color and shape. Before their very eyes, he turned into the red and black visage they all recognized. Carnage! My God, it's Carnage! Those nearest to him shrank away. They knew too well about Carnage's homicidal unpredictability. Hey, don't go away, buddies, Carnage cried. You and me, we're going to party. The serial killers looked at one another. Whispered words came out. It's Carnage, the coolest dude of all, the killer of killers, the most famous serial killer of all time. Now listen up, people, Carnage cried. You know what I always say, nothing is too loathsome as long as it gets a laugh. Am I right or am I right? His audience applauded wildly. And now, Carnage cried, to begin the festivities, let's take ourselves up to that lab and check out those sweet-sounding chemicals. They surged out of the auditorium and into the hallways and up the stairs. The guards retreated. Morrison had told them this might happen, and if it did, they were to fall back for the moment. They were under orders to kill no one except to protect their own lives. And, truth be told, they were glad to get away from the creature who wasn't entirely human. 
head and shoulders taller than the killer's. Carnage is at the front of the mob, leading it as it surged up the stairs to the top floor. On the top floor, they paused a moment to get their bearings. Then, seeing the sign labeled Laboratory One, they charged up to the door. It was also labeled No Admittance, and it was locked. Carnage pushed his way to it. He tried the doorknob, then said, A locked door usually means good stuff inside. With contemptuous ease, he battered in the door and ripped it off its hinges. Then he stepped into the lab, the mob packed close behind, and then he came to a stop. There at the far end of the room, standing on a little raised platform, wearing a long white coat, and with two gleaming test tubes raised in his hand, was Dr. Morrison. Behind him, half concealed by the doctor's bulk, was Ramakrishna. Hi there, Doc, Carnage said. Nice of you to welcome us like this. What's that you got in your hand? Something weird, I hope. Weird enough, Morrison said quietly. He held up one of the test tubes. It was colored a bright cobalt blue. Carnage grinned. Is that one of those lovely psychoactive chemicals I've heard so much about? It is, said Morrison. What I'm holding here is a unique sample of the mind function known as superego. We believe it will produce an increase in that function of mind called conscience. Bottled conscience, Carnage cried with a pointy-toothed smile. I love it. If successful, Morrison continued, it will act as a self-regenerating corrective to your antisocial leanings. You mean it'll make me not want to kill people anymore? Carnage asked mockingly. In a nutshell, that's it. It will bring you the reformation that in your heart of hearts, I know you have been longing for. Carnage laughed an ugly laugh that stated more eloquently than words just what he thought of Morrison's opinion. Undaunted, the doctor continued, I am certain that every intelligent creature yearns for redemption, goodness, and a useful place in society. You know, Doc, Carnage said, you're as bad as those jackasses at Ravencroft. You think I got a secret desire to be good? Give me that stuff. Be careful, Morrison said. It's very rare, priceless. Is that a fact? Carnage grabbed the test tube and crushed it in his hand. Then, to the wild applause of the killers, he allowed his costume to fall away from his head, revealing his red hair. He rubbed the sticky stuff into his curly locks. I've always wanted to have good hair, Carnage said. Maybe this'll do the trick. What's in the other tube? Nothing you'd be interested in, Morrison said, shielding the test tube and the substance within it, which was colored a bright red. Carnage plucked the test tube out of his fingers. Tell me about it, Doc. And no lies. Believe me, I can tell when you're lying. I wouldn't dream of lying to you, Morrison said stiffly. The red substance in that test tube contains the base from which we extracted the superego substance. Base? What are you talking about? In order to get abstract of superego, we had to produce essence of ego first. Carnage held the tube up to the light. Ego, huh? The pure stuff. But you got plenty of that already. Too much, I suspect. Hey, Carnage said. You can't get too much, Ego. Wait, Morrison said. The substance hasn't been tested on a human. Tough shit. Anyway, I'm not exactly human. I'll test it for you, Doc. And if I don't like it... He winked at the killers, who cheered, and cheered again as he lifted the test tube and drained its contents to the last drop. There was a moment of silence. Everyone in the lab stared at Carnage, trying to discern, from the odd gestures of his hands, what was going on in his mind. Ramakrishna, who was watching all this, conjectured that limb movements were inadequate to express what was happening in Carnage's mind. No gesture could convey the sudden flooding sense that Carnage had to be experiencing. A sense of himself, of utter Carnageness. Carnage's view of himself expanded, as if a curtain were suddenly lifted, revealing his true self behind it. What Carnage had taken for granted before, he now saw in all its shocking immediacy. How precious he was. How special, unique, one of a kind, irreplaceable, unreproducible. He saw, bathed in a glorious inner light of pure ego, how fine his body was, 
how cunningly wrought, how exquisitely fashioned. And he saw this not in comparison with the bodies of others. What did others matter? But purely as himself alone, peerless and beyond compare, every hair, every pore glowing with the absolute essence of himself. And if his body were so special, what about his mind? If levels of uniqueness were possible, then his mind was supernally unique, a wonder beyond compare. Not because his mind was finer, deeper, or smarter than other minds. Other minds didn't matter. It was important that this mind, this body, this mind-body were his, his alone, something the world had never seen before and would never see again. It was difficult for Carnage to do anything but stand there, lost in contemplation of himself. Then, gradually, he became aware of the killers, still masked at the laboratory door, shouting, screaming at him. Come on, Carnage, let's get on with it. Time for a little murder, huh, Carnage? Time to kill, time to kill, time to kill. Carnage remembered that once, it seemed a very long time ago, he had gloried in bloodshed and murder. And although he had extraordinary strength and almost superhuman talents, nevertheless, he had risked his life over and over again in mad escapades of killing. He had been hurt, wounded by people like Spider-Man and Venom, time and time again, and had always managed to come through, to heal, and return to kill, and put himself at risk again. Yo, Carnage! Let's go! Carnage stared dully at the raging killers. They wanted him to lead them on yet another escapade, yet another passage through a hell of mayhem and gore. They wanted him to put himself at risk again, to chance injury to his marvelous body and superlative mind, to risk death itself and the loss of all the wonderful things he was. And for what? He remembered those past times now, those times of crazy murder, how good he had felt. But he felt better now. He felt wonderful. There was no feeling he could imagine better than this one, of knowing and loving who and what he was. To take action could only bring him down from this high, not up. He was at the peak now. There was no higher to go. Doc, he said to Morrison, these people are crazy. I guess I used to feel that way before I got a real sense of myself. But now, can you get me out of here? I can, Morrison said. But we're going to have to move fast. Those killers are going to get nasty when they realize you betrayed them. So what? Carnage said. Those morons haven't a clue. I know what good is. Good is me grooving on me, not getting into some crazy situation where I could get hurt. Come on, Morrison said. He touched a button on the wall. A secret panel slid back. He and Carnage ducked into it and closed it before the killers could come pounding after him. Ramakrishna was there, too. He followed them as they hurried down a long, dimly lit corridor. He pressed another button to close the panel, keeping them from the killers. That button would also sound an alarm, thus alerting the guards. They would round the killers up. Where are we going? Carnage asked. Where are you taking me? To a place I think you'll like, Morrison said. At the end of the passageway there was a door. Morrison opened it and led Carnage inside. Ramakrishna following. Carnage found himself in a brightly lit room. It was mirrored on all its walls, and on the floor and ceiling. Carnage stared at himself in the mirrors. He was fascinated by his own reflection on all sides. He could look at himself in endless different postures and angles, close up or at varying distances. All the views of himself were good, and they were all different. He had never known he looked so good. The sight of his own face was sheerest beauty, extreme ecstasy. Looking at himself, he could get ever more deeply into his own mind, deeper and deeper into that magical and irreplaceable essence of himself. Morrison's experiment seemed to be working. It was all perfect, except for one thing. Doc. Yes, Carnage? Too many people in here. Would you very much mind getting the hell out of here? Not at all, Morrison said. You'll be all right. I've got everything I need. Me? Morrison nodded, and by a gesture of the head indicated to Ramakrishna that he should leave. The assistant went to the door, opened it, and walked out. That's better, Carnage said. 
still staring at his reflections in the mirrors. But what about you? I'm going in just a moment, Morrison said. I just have a few questions I want to ask you first. Ramakrishna was watching all this through the door's one-way glass panel. He could hear them talking through the radio hookup with which the room had been equipped. He heard Carnage say, I don't want to answer any questions. This will just take a moment, Morrison said. I need it for my report. Carnage was still staring into a mirrored surface when he gave a slight grunt of annoyance. Ramakrishna thought it was the sight of Morrison there in the mirror with him that brought that response. Carnage's next words seemed to bear this out. Only room for one of us in this mirror, Carnage shouted and whirled, suddenly looming up over Morrison, large and terrifying. Morrison tried to run for the door, but before he could reach it, Carnage was on him. The attack was unbelievably ferocious. Dark gouts of Morrison's blood splashed across the mirrors. The sight of it seemed to bring Carnage back to his deranged senses. He attacked the door. Ramakrishna called for the guards, but they were too late. Carnage had regained himself. The murder of Dr. Morrison, the blood on the mirrors, these had brought him back to his true nature. He broke out of the mirrored room and escaped. The guards easily regained control of the killers, and the original experiment proceeded as normal. Dr. Morrison was buried in a closed casket. This is what Ramakrishna explained almost a year later when he gave his talk in Venice. Dr. Morrison's treatment, Ramakrishna concluded, would not be suitable for a normal human being, but for a supervillain like Carnage, it worked admirably and seemed to prove a theory first put forth by Sigmund Freud, that violence is the result of insufficient ego rather than too much. When the ego function is inflated to its extreme limit, the organism no longer has to prove itself by acting out its violent impulses. At that point, the organism has moved to what we might call the terminal stage of narcissism. This paradoxical effect of the ego substance had been Dr. Morrison's secret weapon, and Carnage had fallen for it. How would you characterize that terminal stage, Dr. Ramakrishna? Someone in the audience asked. It is a complete narcissism, a state characterized by passivity and uninterrupted self-contemplation. The subject will remain that way as long as he has his mirrored room, which he thinks is a refuge, but which is actually a prison. That was what was supposed to happen, and it almost did. Ramakrishna hesitated and said, That's why I said that Dr. Morrison's treatment was a success, even though it failed. That's what would have happened if only Dr. Morrison had been able to restrain his zeal to ask a few more questions. If only he had gotten out of there at once. If only Carnage had not seen the doctor's blood on the mirrors. Someone from the audience asked, Do you think the treatment can be tried again? There's no reason it would not succeed, Ramakrishna said. But I doubt it will ever be repeated. It is not suitable for a normal human. And Carnage is aware of it now, and will not let himself be deceived again. The experiment was a success, ladies and gentlemen, but the subject was not cured. The Wizard and the Sandman The Night I Almost Saved Silver Sable By Tom DeFalco Five jets had already crashed in Miami, and three more were headed toward the ground. A wide grin cut across my face as I glanced at the bodies pictured on the television hanging above Marty's bar. They were sprawled on the field like so much litter, writhing in humiliation more than pain. None of these people would walk away unscathed. Nah, they'd be haunted by this night for the rest of their lives. The memory would always be there, laughing from the shadows. Victories are soon forgotten. Defeats never leave us. But I didn't really care about them. Me, I was tempted to cheer. It was a great night for Dolphins football. The Miami team was murdering the bums from New York. I guess I must have been gloating a little too openly because one of Marty's other regulars suddenly stomped up behind me and jammed a gun into the back of my neck. Okay, I'll admit I had it coming. Marty's is a straight beer and shot joint just off Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. 
People in this neighborhood take their football, especially their New York teams, very seriously. I should have been more sensitive. After all, it ain't like I'm this rabid Dolphins fan. I just feel a certain kinship with places like Miami that have plenty of sun, surf, and sand. I'm especially partial to sand. You see, I'm Bill Baker, though most everybody just calls me the Sandman. A bunch of years back, in my wilder days, I was lying on a beach when I got hit with a massive dose of radiation. Instead of shriveling me like a thin burger on an open flame, the radiation merged me with the sand. It somehow gave me the ability to transform all or part of my body into pure sand that I could mold into any shape I wanted. I could also control my density, becoming as hard as concrete or as insubstantial as, well, a fistful of sand. Of course, the guy behind me wasn't particularly concerned with my past. He was focused on the present and didn't like me ignoring him. His annoyance was becoming increasingly apparent as he dug his gun into the base of my skull, twisting the barrel like he was a twelve-year-old giving his first noogie. In an effort to be helpful, I willed that portion of my head to assume the consistency of quicksand. It immediately gave way beneath his pressure, swallowing the gun and most of his hand before he realized he should stop pushing. The game's gonna play out in its own way, pal. We can't affect its outcome, I said, my eyes never leaving the television. You want to fight about it or share a brew? I don't care about no game. My name's Pound and I got a message. My gaze dropped from the television to the barroom mirror and I caught a look at the guy. Pound was tall, with the wide shoulders and brawny arms of a lifter who'd like to be admired. I knew the type. A bruiser who collected debts or imparted threats, imitating most people by his sheer bulk. A guy his size rarely had to throw punches. His experience on the receiving end would be even less. Let go of my hand. You ain't gonna hurt me. You don't dare. Pound sneered, in a voice so low it almost masked his fear. My boss has yours. My current employer happened to be a very special lady. The thought of her in danger made my blood boil. Or it would have, if my veins carried blood. I wanted to whip my head around, maybe yanking his arm out of its socket in the process. Instead, I reached for my beer and tore off a sip. You got proof? Pound didn't answer. He was working up a sweat, trying to yank his hand free. But his eyes jumped to mine when the back of my head assumed the shape of a vice. Proof? I prodded. I got a number, Pound mumbled. He gave it to me, and I signaled Marty for a phone. Any other bartender might have been a little curious to see one patron with his fist shoved up someone else's noggin. Not Marty. He was a master at minding his own business. Never even gave us a second glance. That's one of the things I like about his place. The phone at the other end had barely started to ring when a cold and familiar voice cut in. Good evening, William, the wizard said. I have been expecting your call. The wizard. He was a former partner from the old days. Long before I met him, he was a big brain who became stinking rich by inventing a whole bunch of futuristic gizmos. You'd think a guy like that would just lay back and count his bucks, but something made him want to devote his genius toward crime. I always figured it was an ego thing. He just had to compete with the costumed jocks, had to prove his brain superior to their superhuman powers. Still there, William? A friend of yours would like to say hello. There was a slight pause, and then Silver Sable said without preamble, I am uninjured, Sandman. Do not be concerned and do not get involved. Silver's voice sounded distracted, like she was a receptionist flipping through the latest fashion mags as she rattled off the same lunch order day after day. But I knew better. Silver was a consummate professional, always alert, always studying her surroundings. I didn't lie when I said she was very special. She ran an international private security force that concentrated on bagging wanted criminals and recovering stolen property. Her operatives were known as the Wild Pack, and I was a member. She tossed me a lifeline a few years ago when I really needed it, giving me a chance to redeem myself from my days as a criminal. It was a debt I could never even hope to repay. How'd this happen, lady? Pure carelessness. I had intended to visit a few shops and never even noticed the new limo driver until he flooded the passenger compartment with something which made me very sleepy. A smile crept across my lips. 
Silver could identify every knockout gas on the market, including a few which weren't even available to the top secretist government agencies. She was only playing dumb and dazed, maybe because she picked up on the wizard's need to dominate. I almost felt sorry for the poor guy. He was in more trouble than he'd bargained for. Anything you need? Another chauffeur. I'm afraid the new fellow sustained a rather nasty concussion before I went down for my nap. Hey, a voice growled behind me. What about my hand? Pound was still pawing at my back like crazy, but I couldn't afford to be distracted. Fastening my eyes on his reflection, I saw the look of panic on his face when I tightened my vice. Enough chit-chat, the wizard suddenly barked in my ear. I am willing to make a trade, William. Mr. Pound will assist you. I look forward to seeing you again, he added as our connection died. My hand, Pound snarled. What about my hand? We'll discuss it. I stood, snagging Marty's attention. Mind if I use the back room? Just so long as you clean up after yourself. Sounded like a good deal to me. With Pound dragging behind like a kid in a toy store, I marched through the bar, trying not to block anyone's view of the game. Me? I'd lost interest. I had to concentrate on my own opening kickoff. Marty had two rooms in the back. One was his office and close to the public. The other doubled as an occasional storeroom and the site of a weekly high-stakes poker game. The only furniture consisted of a large round table and six chairs. Cartons of napkins and towels huddled against the back wall, waiting to be called into action against some massive spill. I reached up, as if to scratch the back of my head, shifted some sand around, and encased Pound's gun and hand in a large square block, which should have been my right fist. Moving the block in front of me, I buried Pound in the nearest chair. We locked eyes over my forearm as he made a sincere effort to regain his composure, bluster filling his cheeks like a circus balloon. You don't scare me. I don't? You ain't never gonna to see that woman again, Sandman. Not without my cooperation. Really? Let go of my hand. He started to whine, his facade crumbling before my eyes. Pound had obviously figured his muscle would carry any battle, but I had taken that away from him. It was like a fancy sports car with a blown transmission. He still looked great, but his racing days were over. You're going to tell me everything I need to know, I said. Fat chance, you can't make me talk. Actually, I said as I reformed my entire forearm into a miniature guillotine. I'm sure I can. I wasn't wrong. A little over an hour later, I was steering Pound's car up Route 684, heading for the fourth exit. My destination was an upper Westchester estate in the town of Bedford. Stuffed in the trunk, Pound was sleeping off a friendly haymaker when I'd last seen him. Who knows? He might have been awake by now. I didn't care. He had already done his Elton John, singing like a man possessed when he'd thought I'd actually use my arm, shaped like an executioner's axe, to cut his head off. The wizard's plan was pure butter. I climb into an unbreakable canister, which Pound delivers to the wizard in exchange for silver. Yeah, right. My former partner knew I'd never put myself in such a helpless position, and I knew he knew it. The so-called plan had only one purpose to convince a dummy like Pound that he had me at a disadvantage. The wizard could have called me at the bar, but that just wasn't flashy enough. What fun would it be if I just got his message and walked in the front door? His ego wanted more. He needed an elaborate chess game to keep me running, desperately trying to come up with counter moves he had already anticipated. He wouldn't be satisfied until I was totally demoralized. Why do supervillains always construct such elaborate death traps? What's wrong with a good old-fashioned bullet to the brain? I guess it's the same reason they dress in flashy costumes and take such crazy names. The wingless wizard, the rampaging rhino, the daring trapster, the deadly hobgoblin. I should talk. In the old days, I was either the sinister or the savage. Now I'm just the Sandman. A supervillain isn't content with merely winning. He needs his victory to be acknowledged. He wants his defeated foe to jump up and shout, Wow, you're the greatest! I've never stumbled into such a clever trap or been pummeled so viciously. You're the scariest supervillain of all. The other heroes must be warned about you. 
Yeah, I know exactly how supervillains think. I used to be as bad as the worst. Not that I've changed all that much. I could have questioned Pound without resorting to that corny guillotine trick. Silver had told me to stay out of it. I could have followed standard wild pack procedure, called in her kidnapping, and left her rescue to a hostage team. Nah, I had to play cowboy. I told myself it was because I didn't want to endanger anyone else in what was, essentially, a private war. Bad enough Silver was already splattered with this mud. It sounded okay, but I couldn't escape the truth. Yeah, I could have played this whole gig much safer, and a whole lot smarter. But hey, what's the fun in that? I had to hand it to Pound. His directions were excellent. I coasted to a stop beside the stone wall that surrounded the estate the wizard presently occupied. I parked along its northeast side, avoiding both the front and back entrances. Trying to take the wizard by surprise might have been pointless, but this game had rules. The wall rose a good ten feet above the ground. Wrapping my knuckles on the trunk, I told Pound to wish me luck, but I didn't catch his mumbled reply. Probably just as well. Forming myself into a single stream of sand, I stretched my body upward in a maneuver I'd seen Mr. Fantastic do lots of times. The top of the wall was covered with broken glass and had a three-foot extension of barbed wire, but that wasn't all. Partially covered by the glass, a metallic strip gleamed in the moonlight. It was one of the wizard's gizmos, some kind of high-tech motion sensor. Okay, if going over the wall was out of the question, I just have to go through it. Spreading myself paper thin, I plastered myself against the side of the wall, looking for weaknesses. I finally found a tiny crack in the mortar that held a few stones in place. It wasn't a lot wider than a pencil point, but more than enough space for a grain of sand. Pass enough grains through, and you had a sandman. Assuming that the wizard would have a little bit more than a measly stone wall protecting him, I took the shape of a giant sand snake and slithered across the big lawn toward the house. About two hundred yards separated me from the mansion itself. After about ten feet, I noticed a thin copper filament that ran across the ground and connected two of the trees in the lawn. Talk about luck. I'd only seen it because of my snake's eye view. I was still congratulating myself on my keen powers of observation when a jolt of electricity suddenly ran through me. I hit the ground in a ball of dizziness and nausea. A half dozen men sprang from behind the trees. They were all wearing night goggles and carrying funny-looking weapons which looked like the wizard's handiwork. Hit him again! Someone shouted. He's still moving! The lead man triggered his blaster. Agony slammed into me like a tidal wave. My body corkscrewed like it had been tossed on a hot spit. It felt like being charbroiled from the inside out. Rough hands ripped at me, yanking me to my feet. Feet? Sand snakes don't have feet. It took a few seconds to realize that I'd reverted to human form. Even as I wrapped myself around that idea, I was manhandled across the lawn and into the mansion. Careening through a side entrance, I ricocheted off a few walls until I found a nice hard floor to cuddle up on. I would have loved a quick nap, but this annoying foot chose that moment to introduce itself to my face. Persistent little devil, that foot. It moved to my ribs, greeting them enthusiastically making me further appreciate the distinctive advantages of sand over bones. That is quite enough. He deserves it for what he done to me. I'm gonna kill him. Please, Mr. Pound, the wizard said in a low voice. That honor is mine. I rolled to my side so that I could look up. I expected to see the wizard. Pound was a surprise. His face and hair, stained with oil and grease, was leaking sweat like a rusted steam pipe. Kicking a helpless man must require a lot more effort than I would have thought. Love what you've done with your hair, Pound, I said. He made a move toward me, as if to resume soccer practice, but the wizard cut him a look that could have melted steel. Dressed in a suit the color of fresh cream, with a mocha shirt and a chocolate fudge tie, the wizard looked like a fancy cup of coffee. He had a dopey grin on his face. He was obviously enjoying himself. Hey, it's not every day you get to link up with an old teammate. Mr. Pound is rather annoyed with you, William. I would not continue to antagonize him. Some guys just can't take a compliment. I knew he wanted me to ask how Pound had gotten out of the trunk, but I merely smiled. The silence lengthened. In case you are interested, Pound's car and his right shoe were equipped with homing beacons. 
the wizard said, irritation creeping into his tone. Your efforts to catch me unawares were quite comical. I ain't no Seinfeld, but I've always been good for a few laughs. The wizard's military wannabes were standing behind me. We were in some kind of game room. A pool table lounged in a distant corner, and the heads of dead animals stared down at me from the walls. I figured that the next spot on the wall already had my name on it. This place come furnished? An odd question, William, when I am sure you have so many others on your mind. Actually, I am curious about one thing. Triumph flared in the wizard's eyes, filling them with a smile which never quite reached his mouth. What is that? You catch the final score on the Jets game? Like an old circus horse counting out his numbers on the ground, Pound put his foot back to work on my chest. Just my luck. A high-scoring game. As he moved into double digits, Pound began to lose enthusiasm. Or maybe he was just losing count. Either way, the wizard had grown bored. Get the woman, Pound. Pound aimed a final half-hearted swipe at my face and headed toward a staircase that stood outside the room's doorway. The wizard glanced meaningfully in my direction. Two of his goons pulled me into a standing position. I am very disappointed with you, William. You are my mother both, I said. What's the deal with the lady wizard? I'm the one you want. You don't care about Silver Sable. Why didn't you just come after me? An example needed to be made, William. At last, the smile had finally reached his lips. You cannot be permitted to switch loyalties from me to her without the appropriate consequences. As a former associate, your actions reflect on me. Have you no idea how foolish I appear because you have taken on this role of common mercenary? Come on, man. Nobody holds you responsible because I ditched out on crime. Wrong, William. Very wrong. I swear I could almost see the raging beast that had twisted a millionaire brain boy into a criminal genius. No wonder the spandex set couldn't keep the wizard down. Nobody could ever cage or crush a creature like that. He'd always be back. As this dawned on me, I suddenly stopped breathing. The wizard began to laugh. This moment, William, he managed to gasp out. This single moment has justified all the time and expense devoted to the entire enterprise. I wanted to smack him down with a witty comeback, but I couldn't. He was right. He had already gotten all he needed from me. I was still trying to figure out what I should do next when the room suddenly exploded with gunshots. Reacting instinctively, I yanked at the two men who were holding my arms, bringing their heads together with a satisfying crack. Everybody else in the room, including the wizard, was diving for cover. This way, Sandman! Silver Sable shouted as she popped another round into the room. I dove through the doorway, joining her in the hall. A handful of the wizard's lowlifes were scrambling into rooms to our right, and I could hear footsteps approaching from the front entrance. The left seemed clear, so we raced for the sliding glass door at the end of the hall, hoping it led to an outdoor porch. I thought I told you not to get involved. Nice to see you too, I said. If that's Pound's gun, you'd better check it for sand. She roasted me with a quick glance as she threw the door open. A gust of warm air rose in greeting. I had to admire the wizard's sense of style. The mansion came with its own indoor pool. A large mural full of forest greenery was painted along the walls, but I would have preferred a window or two. The only exit was a stairwell to the basement. Under normal circumstances, a basement was a bad place to be cornered, but we didn't have much choice. You shouldn't have come. Silver said as we jostled downward. You've only complicated the situation. Oh, sure. I suppose you had everything under control. You didn't honestly believe that I fell for the old switch-the-chauffeur ploy. I got in a tit that the wizard was going to try to use me to reach you. A slight smile danced across her lips. A wild pack strike team has been on my tail for the past two weeks. They were awaiting my signal when you bumbled on the scene. Why am I the last to know? The wizard wouldn't have taken the bait if he'd noticed you looking over your shoulder. She smirked. And naturally, I didn't want to risk the reward posted on him. The basement consisted of a single corridor, which seemed to run the length of the house. Little storage rooms branched off the main walkway, but I was focused on the second set of stairs, which lay dead ahead. Unfortunately, a squad of his hard bodies had already come around the house to use that stairway to intercept us. 
and came armed with those special zappers that turned my insides earlier. Having run out of options, Silver and I ducked into a utility room near the mansion's midpoint. An idea began to form when I saw the three gas burners that heated the joint. How long will the pack wait for your signal? I asked Silver. Too long, she said. I'm down to my last bullets. Okay, I guess it's showtime, I said as I shaped my arm into a large wrench. Unscrewing the gas main that fed the burners, I quickly molded myself into a concrete cylinder that stretched from the mouth of the pipe to the basement ceiling. I wasn't completely airtight, but I could still feel the gas pressure building within me. I snaked out a fist and began ripping at the ceiling tiles, exposing the wood which served as the understructure for the mansion's first floor. Hurry it up, Silver said as she squeezed off her last shot. We're out of time. I punched my fist to the floor and was rewarded with a shout. A few of the wizard's men had been left behind on the floor above. They immediately opened fire, supplying me with sparks aplenty for what I had in mind. I became a living flamethrower with an entire gas line to fuel me. Puffing more air through my chest, I aimed for the nearest windows. I wanted to light the outside sky with a massive flare. Instead, I ignited the draperies and furniture. What the hell are you doing up there? Silver wanted to know. Losing the wizard's security deposit, I replied as I turned my attention to the guys in the corridor. My flaming stream inspired them to reevaluate their employment contracts as they ran like hell. The mansion's smoke detectors were shrieking like crazy by now. So were the wizard's men. I figured a house this fancy had to have an alarm system tied directly to the local firehouse. It did, and the place was soon flooded with a mess of firefighters and cops, not to mention Silver's own wild pack. Though the locals were a little shocked to find so many alleged felons within their borders, the wizard's men were all rounded up by the time we made it outside. Always the professional, Silver Sable immediately staked her claim for every penny posted on them. Me, I did a quick head count, but found only one of the two I most wanted. The wizard is long gone, Pound said. He zapped out of here long before you made like the human torch. He say anything? Nah, Pound sneered as he was gently maneuvered into an awaiting police car. But he was still laughing. I almost laughed out loud myself. I still had things to resolve with Silver, but the wizard was gone, and had no reason to return. Though it had cost him a gang, and who knows what else, he was now savoring a victory instead of nursing a defeat. Okay, maybe I hadn't been completely honest with my former partner. Maybe I shouldn't have held my breath and tried to outsmart him. Yeah... Maybe I just should have played him straight. But hey, what's the fun in that? Typhoid. Who do you want me to be? By Anne Nocenti. Scritch, scritch. The interviewer sits in a high, comfortable chair, making scratchy little notes on a legal pad. Why did you eat all those strawberries this morning? He asks. Because she's allergic. That way if she tries to come out, she gets hives. The woman slouches a few paces away on a shorter, hard metal chair. They are alone, the two of them, in an empty room, surrounded by four white walls. The sharp pencil continues to make its lone, twitchy sound on the paper, like an insect busy with some irritating chore. The woman lets her eyes travel the length of the interrogator's body. These interview types, she decides, are indistinguishable easily marked. You got any lead in that pencil of yours? She speaks very slowly, every syllable emphasized as if with certain intent. But then again, it could just be the sedatives. If I wasn't handcuffed, I'd show you an ancient druid finger technique that'd have you melting like an ice cube in hell. Gotcha. You're the sex fiend. He begins to make another smug mark on the pad, but the pencil's tip snaps. The chair legs scrape the floor. She kicks off a slipper, stretches out her leg, and manages to just touch his ankle with one silky toe. He flinches. Stop that. Sit still. I'm immune to your tricks. Right, Sarge. The foot withdraws. A fresh pencil is back. Scritch, scritch. Now, as I was saying, today you're the compulsive seducer. Oh, yeah? That's just what you want me to be. A little counter-transference thing happening, Doc? Wrong office for that. 
You don't know anything. You never leave these dull offices and square cells and interrogation rooms. Your world has the dimension of a box. Tell me, which came first, the germ or the disease? Excuse me, but I ask the questions here. Oh, just try and answer. Well, the... I guess I don't know. Ha! Huh. The answer is never clear. And it's always what you least suspect. It's the innocent, retarded, blind, deaf, wall-eyed fool that really runs the show. Ask her. I am asking her. You don't exist, except as a reflection in the mind of the others. What are we talking, quantum physics here? I exist. I don't exist. If I'm here, I can't be there. Either or neither. Which is it? Am I the disease or am I the germ? You're revealing a bit of knowledge there. You must read books. Either that or you went to school. Scritch, scritch, scritch. Do you have to make all those grating little notes? You got all the personality of fingernails on a blackboard. And your conclusion is wrong, anyway. I learned particle physics from a TV movie I saw once. It was about a physicist that fell in love, but wasn't sure. I can't imagine you sitting still through an entire movie. It must have been... Mary? Yes. She's the one that watches all those soap operas. She's the idiot that needs TV fantasies. But if I didn't watch the movie, how do I know the plot? Maybe you girls talk to each other. Now that would be impossible, wouldn't it, Professor? Do you? Do we what? Talk to each other. No, never. But then, I could be lying. The interrogator nodded and repeated. But then you could be lying. Well, forget it. We don't have anything to talk about. We don't like the same things. We live in different movies. Oh, really? Then tell me, is it just you that enjoys violence, or do the others enjoy a bit of blood as well? Now, why would I answer that and invite complicity? You're all the same. Stupid. Shrinks, cops, jailers, wardens, all the same. Stupid. And what would we do if we were smart? You take advantage of hot, willing flesh and how crazy it could make you? Stop that talk. Ooh, yes, Captain. Right away, Captain. You don't want me. You haven't been staring at my body, sneaking glances at my flesh. The interrogator began to have trouble focusing on the captive's eyes, as if her eyes were a scrim on which a projected color went in and out of focus, and several different beings peered out of those changeling orbs in turn. At times, the eyes were certainly light gray, only to deepen in the next moment to a red-brown. You know, I am here to help you. I am not one of your enemies. Enemies? Real or imagined, doctor? Wouldn't that be evidence of paranoia? Is the patient exhibiting a bipolar state with hallucinatory features? Don't be ridiculous. You run from my every attempt to... Uh-oh. I think it's a disassociative disorder. Yes, she's one sick... Please, can we get back to... Or perhaps she's in a psychogenic fugue state. No, I think perhaps she was just dropped on her head as a child. That's it. The old bounced baby syndrome. You're impossible. Could I continue, please? Why not? Thank you. Now, why don't you try answering one question honestly? Like that game? Are we going to play truth or dare? I'll take the dare. Okay. Dare to tell the truth. Right, boss. One question. Are you aware that you have many personalities living in your head? Sure, who doesn't? Everybody disassociates. Hey, it's great. I mean, I got this one chick in me, this boring one, this walker. She pays the bills. She does the banking. She does all that niggling stuff I can't be bothered with. Wouldn't you like a bill-paying robot all your own? And when we get in trouble, why, there's always sweet, innocent Mary to bail us out. She gives us our sympathy. She's the baby. I hate her, actually. She gets all the dreams. It's not fair. I never get to dream. But what the heck? She cooks. She cleans. I don't got to do that. Mary is the closest to the pain and the furthest from knowing why. She's blind and her face is right up in it. Walker's the one that knows all. She's the gatekeeper. Now, if we really get in trouble, there's always bloody to protect us. She doesn't care about all that inner life crap. She just keeps us alive. And you? What do you do? Me? I get us laid. Guilt-free sex. All those slaves to do the dirty work and I just have fun, fun, fun. 
Tell me, wouldn't you like to be me? It's still you doing the boring things. Nah, not to me it ain't. Ha, but I know what note you just scribbled down there now, daddy-o. I can just imagine you using big, lumbering, cumbersome words like compartmentalized and recidivism. Taking notes is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Oh, really? I'll read you one note. In the course of this interview, you've called me boss, captain, professor, sarge, doc, and daddy-o. What do you think that means? Nothing. It means nothing. By the way, look at your arm. Strawberry hives, I believe. Shut up! This is boring. Her voice climbs an octave with each phrase. You're not the one that's got to go back to a dirt.